Why did language develop to have the features we normally associate with it? Why is there grammatical structure or ambiguity? It's an understatement to say that language is of great interest in AI right now. I wanted to speak to somebody who studies language and how it develops in humans. Ted Gibson, who leads the eponymous TED Lab at MIT, investigates why languages look the way they do and many fascinating questions that fall under this umbrella. We spoke about topics like the purpose of language, linguistic universals, how humans ordinarily process language, and processing difficulty. There are a lot of fascinating ideas in this episode, but one I want to flag here is Professor Gibson's point that we might think about language models themselves as theories of language. You'll have to excuse my voice in this episode. I was at the tail end of recovering from the flu, but hopefully it's bearable enough to listen to. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I'm your host, Daniel Bashir. If you're listening to this and you're not subscribed to The Gradient in some way, I think you should go fix that. You can subscribe to the podcast on your usual podcast player to make sure you get episodes when I release them every week. And if you want to get the rest of what we put out on The Gradient, that means this podcast, our newsletter, and articles from our online magazine, then you can subscribe to us through Substack. And finally, if you like what we're doing, it would really mean a lot to all of us if you'd consider sharing this or whatever else you like on The Gradient. We're a pretty small team, this podcast is a one-man effort, and the entire Gradient publication is run by a very small group of dedicated volunteers. So whenever you do share our things around, when you leave comments for us, when you give us feedback, we all really, really appreciate it. But now, without further ado, Ted Gibson. Ted, Professor Gibson, you've been really interested in studying the nature of language. How do humans represent language? What is the purpose of language in the first place? And have done a lot of really interesting work in this area. As usual, I'd like to start with a little bit about your background. How did you become interested in, well, language and studying the questions you do in the first place? Um, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> I mean, so my background, as you said, is, uh, well, my background is math and computer science originally. I did my undergraduate degrees in math and computer science. I double majored in those in Canada. I'm from Canada, I'm from uh, Toronto, and I went to Queen's University undergrad in Kingston, Ontario. And then from there, actually, I'd never taken any psych or linguistics at all. I, all it took was math and CS, basically, and some other hard science stuff. And I had taken an AI course, an artificial intelligence class, and I really liked that um, that class, and I liked the language section in that class. And in part, I liked the language. I just liked the topic of human language, and I sort of. And then I ended up apply the 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 state of the art of the research in the '80s wasn't great. In the early '80s, I'd say in language research wasn't really great. And so I was interested in that because I felt like the um, even from my naive. Um, perspective that it didn't feel like the um, the way that the questions were being answered was very satisfactory. So it felt like I could help, you know, to solve some of these interesting problems. And so I did a I went I went I applied for a master's program at Cambridge, at Cambridge University in the UK, and I did an MPhil in computational linguistics. And there I learned a lot more about um, you know both both computational. Um, approaches to language and psych and linguistic psychology and linguistics approaches. They they had a very nice uh, one year course at Cambridge at the time. And I think it's still going on, um, where it w was a joint of sort of three uh, approaches to problems in language. It was in the engineering. It was it was actually in the elect electrical engineering department, but they brought in um, psychologists and linguists as well to uh, educate us on various aspects of language. And so. I just found the problems there that I really ran into for the first time interesting, and I just never stopped. That was in 1985, 86, and I um, I could have done a bunch of things, and I just found these problems interesting, and so um, and and I, I could tell they weren't solved, <laughs> and so I uh, I was very interested in the human aspect of it, like what, how do humans process language, and how might we implement 
uh, models to simulate that in some way. And with, with the idea of just trying to understand how humans produce and understand language. Um, and, you know, I, I hadn't at the, at the time thought so much about why that might that, that that might have impact on why human why why human language looks the way it does and over 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 a, not very long it you know lots of people had proposed that you know at even way back then and so that was a an angle that I was interested in pursuing and so uh, I just worked on this and really started like that's how many years ago is that in the eighties it's almost forty years ago yeah. One of the really common things I think people talk about, you mentioned this wasn't necessarily a bridge for you, but the fact that earlier when you were taking this AI course, you kind of liked the language section of it. My understanding, and I think a lot of people notice that decades ago, I think that there was maybe a little bit more of an influence of linguistics on the natural language processing community. And if you look at methods like what Richard Soger worked on with Chris Manning, there was a lot more explicit use of things like uh, like grammatical trees and, and these sorts of things in the methods people were using. And that feels much less the case today. But I'm curious a little bit about when you were maybe first kind of navigating all of this, studying CS and math, to even if you weren't really taking linguistics classes, did you feel that? there was maybe a little bit more of kind of an explicitness that it was, that it had an impact kind of on the work that you were doing and what you were learning. Um, you know, it, when, even when I was a grad student in the computational linguistics community a little bit, um, I, I'd say it wasn't that different. It was a much smaller community. So the, the computational linguistics community wasn't huge at that point. It was, there was, you know, the ACL conference was maybe thousand people or 500 or something is much, much smaller than it currently is. Uh, um, but, but even then, uh, it was very engineering focused. It was very engineering. It was uh, very applied. And so I, I, I don't really think it was very different. It was, so I was, uh, I was, so I'm not like, even though my background is math and computer science, my, my goals were always about human. I'm in the brain and cognitive science department. I work on how humans process language and, um, and, and you know, produce and comprehend language, and trying to understand, you know, how that process works, which is not is not a, a standard part of ACL then, and it isn't now either. So in the computational linguistics community, these are just different. So that in the computational linguistics community, the the, the goals are engineering, the goals are applied, gen, you know, overall, o overwhelmingly, I'd say, overwhelming, and they were back then as well, um, and uh, they're just. You know, slightly, you know, the methods changed over the years as to what what things work better and worse, but the goals were very similar. So I actually don't think it was very different. It was still an outlier. You know, it, when, when I was involved a little bit, it, I, I wasn't very heavily involved in that community. I was much more involved in, even though my background was in math and computer science, my, I ended up in, I'm in a, what's, you know, MIT's psych department, psychology department, the brain and cognitive sciences department. They don't have a psych department. This is what we have. And um, it is, you know, computationally oriented because it's MIT in, in, in many ways, but it's still, we're trying to understand the nature of, you know, the human mind and how, how various aspects of mind, the mind works. And I work, I happen to work on language, but the ACL community, I don't think is actually hasn't, it's just got huge, it's just got giant, you know, because I mean, it's been so successful. It's worked so well. These, you know, you know, various deep neural nets and so on work so well at solving so many problems in language that that, that community is enormous. Um, but back then, it was the same kind of ratio, I'd say. It was like not, you know, human approaches are, are just not, you know, in engineering approaches are more like the, the topic is more about trying to um, engineer something as opposed to figure out human processing. I mean, you know, the idea is that maybe if we figure out how humans, humans process language, it might have useful engineering um, applications. But, you know, I think most people in that community don't, don't think that way. They mostly just want to get, go right to the engineering applications and feel, fear, let's figure out the best way to do those engineering applications. They don't want to go through humans on the way. And so my goal has never been to do the engineering applications. My goal is just to figure out the human stuff. And if there are applications, great. And if there aren't, it doesn't matter too much to me. Uh, presumably, there'll be some kinds of applications, even if they're not, not NLP kinds of applications, there'll be you know, applications in understanding uh, you know, brain damage, for example, and language and this kind of you know, application. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I just study language because it's 
interesting and fun. <laughs> Not because I, I, you know, different people do different. I think many people work that way. They just find the problem interesting. Whatever problem is they're working on, they just find it interesting. And that's 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 what I do. I have I don't necessarily have a top down goal of trying to solve some um, engineering problem or or even like an app any or an application problem. Say in in medical science, people. Some people do that work that way in, in my department, trying to understand you know, a cure for some you know disease or a cure for some um, you know degenerative um, property. And I'm I'm just doing basic science, trying to understand the nature of language. It's a little bit different, but it's not uncommon in in sciences. I think so. It's interesting to contrast that certainly with I don't know how much of a contrast it is, but the way that a lot of people within artificial intelligence kind of articulate themselves is with this engineering mantra of, well, the best way I can understand something is to build it. But I do think that can sometimes slip into this alternate, I've got a model or something that I've built that is maybe loosely based off of intuitions of the thing I'm uh, I'm trying to model. So neural networks, for instance. And so I take the model that I've built and start to derive insights about the thing that I was originally trying to model from this thing, even if it was, so if I'm interested in the human brain, I'm like, okay, I have this kind of loosely based model of it in neural network. And then I build the thing, I look at how the thing behaves. And then I say, oh, well, the human brain must be like this because I was building something that was loosely based off of the human brain in the first place. I think that some people are, are very careful about this, but it does feel like there's also a lot of people who kind of make these, these leaps that don't necessarily seem like they're as conducive to really understanding how humans, how human brains really work. Yeah. um, I don't work that way. So first of all, I don't, I mostly do behavioral work. So mostly that most of my work has been either, you know, behavioral, trying to understand sort of at a high level, different aspects of how models might work as opposed to at a, um, like a, you know, detailed implemented model of, of a lot of, like like these neural network models you're in sort of implicitly, you know, hinting at or probably they're, they're covering a lot more. They're very broad coverage. Kind of, the current models are very broad and I'm not sort of working on in that end. So I'm just, I, I work at a sort of different level, I'd say. I, I there, There's a lot to be gained from people doing things different ways. Uh, you know, it's, it's true. Maybe some things maybe get overstated sometimes. There may be overstatements about what the, what they, what the, they mean what the models mean, but you know that's sales in some part. People sell things well or less well. I don't know. I don't have much to say about that. Fair enough. So let's start diving into a couple of the different things that you focused on in your work. And I think the first one that you pointed out to me was understanding how dependency distances affect language processing. And this is something that kind of came up in, in a recent episode I had with Tal Lindzen, where we were speaking about the effect of these sorts of distances on how people reported processing difficulty when they were reading sentences, for instance, and how those greater distances between, say, a pronoun or something, and then the information that I'm to learn about that pronoun might actually really impact my my feeling of how difficult it was to parse a sentence, to understand a sentence. And you have a number of works on this. In 1998, you proposed the syntactic prediction locality theory, where you kind of talk about this integration cost and a component for memory cost when you're kind of keeping track of things. Could you talk a little bit about how you you studied this phenomenon of dependency distances and how you kind of broke things down? So the origin, yeah, the um, the origin of that, I guess, is uh, that's an old problem. There's an old bunch of old problems in the psycholinguistics literature, which is just basically trying to understand uh, how people either produce or understand mostly utterances here, which is like a fancy word for sentences, roughly, you know, so, uh, you know, an utterance technically is just anything that I might say to you, a sentence typically is something that has a verb in it somewhere or other. So in most Utterances in English happen to have verbs in it, so people talk about sentences a lot as is, is a sort of standard utterance. And so it's a lot about how sentences are produced and understood. And going back to, um, you know, actually Noam Chomsky and people before him, even a guy called Victor Ingvi, 
back in the night in late, you know, early 1960s. So 1960 was this guy, Victor Ingby had noticed that there are different structures, which are easier, hard to understand with, he was focused on English. Okay. So he was, and uh, he was focused on things like um, embedding clauses within other clauses. And so I can say um, the, the dog, uh, how about the cat, which the dog chased ran away. And so that's a clause there, a relative clause that the, that the dog chased is modifying cat. And the cat is the thing running away and the, that the dog chase happens in between there. In be, that, that's called a center embedded or a nested dependency. We've got the, the cat ran away. And in between that in English, it's possible to modify that clause that that whole that subject there, the noun phrase with another clause, you can do that. And and this guy Victor Ingvi and some other people noticed that if you do that, like it seems like it's okay in the grammar in some ways to do that again. So I can say the 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 cat, which the dog, which the you know the human owned chased ran away. Somehow that's it's gram grammatical in some sense. It's like a, it's a thing that we should be able to say. And yet it's really hard to say, you know, it, it's really complicated when I do that embedding again, a second time, I, you know, there was one embedded clause. Now I try to embed another clause within that other, that, that second clause was the cat, um, the, the dog, you know, the cat, which the dog chased, right? The cat, which the dog chased. And now I'm like saying dog and who's the dog. It's the dog, which, you know, John owned or some, some person owned or something. I can't remember what clause I had there. I was trying to make it kind of unambiguous in some way, helping to understand. Uh, but it's really weird to say or understand. It's really difficult to say the, that whatever I said, the cat, which the, which the dog who John owned chased ran away. It's just very difficult for me to produce even now. And it's probably really hard for your listeners and you to understand that, that sentence. And so this guy, Victor Ingvi noticed this and he, and, and he had a story which was about um, basically stack, a push down automata and basically stacking things too many, too many stacked push, push downs in English would cause this to break. And, and what I noticed, and then I mentioned Noam Chomsky and Chomsky Miller a little bit later, they had this slightly different story of the same phenomena uh, in, in 1963, going way back to them. And, and um, in my work in the, in the, basically in the early nineties and mid nineties, there's what you're pointing out. It's like, there's a, it's a nice a generalization about these kinds of materials and what makes them hard instead of thinking of it as the push down stack and pushing too many things on their part. It's not, that's maybe part of the difficulty, but another part of the problem is in, in any sentence, in any human language, in any utterance, what all, you always have dependencies between words. And so that simple thing there, which, you know, just start with the, the, the cat, you know, which the dog chased, there's a dependency between dog be, between, uh, between the, the, the subjects and the verbs there and between the objects and the verbs. And, and if you just notice that the things that are really hard to produce and understand happen to have really long connections that you have to make. So it's about dependency length, which makes these things hard to potentially, that's a different story than how many things you have to stack, but just how long these dependencies are makes things potentially hard to understand and maybe produce. Maybe it's about dependency length, which is making things hard. And that was the, the observation I was pursuing in that syntactic prediction locality theory is about locality in there. And then there's a slight variant, variant of that a couple of years later, which is which is just dependency locality theory, just basically a generalization. It's really all of maybe what makes things difficult in language. It's a really simple generalization in any, for any utterance you can, if I say, I'll just, let's, let's not go with those complicated structures. We say, you know, Mary kicked the ball. There's a dependency between the and ball. There's a dependency between Mary and kicked. And there's a dependency between kicked and ball. Okay. And, and the closer those things are, the easier it is to produce those things for people and the and easier it is for you as a listener to understand them. That that turns out to be generally true. And, and English has a particular word order, which is subjects, you know, agents first, then verbs, then patients. That's a subject, verb, object, word order, language. It turns out it doesn't matter what, you know, and there's many different, there's, there's like really kind of two really dominant word orders across the world's language. That's a really common one. SVO is the standard. Um, it's just like, um, it's in lots of, 
you know, about about 40% of the of the Engl of the languages around the of, of the 7,000 languages currently spoken, around 40% of those are SVO. But even more, about 50% are verb final or SOV, subject, object, verb. And those are languages like, you know, Korean or Japanese or Hindi. Um, and, and so instead of saying, you know, Mary um, kicked the ball, you say Mary ball kicked. Okay, so the verb comes at the end as subject, object, verb. And those are the two really dominant. There's another word order, which is pretty common, which is like five or 10%, which is verb, subject, object, VSO. Anyway, but in any of these language, the tip of those are like, that's a really interesting question. It's like, why do languages have different word words, which I will, you know, maybe we'll get to that later. But um, it, it, whatever they have, they happen to have, they all minimize dependency lengths to some degree. So, and, and they all, they all tend to the prefer very short dependencies. So that the way you say something, the structures that you use varies across languages in some ways, because you know, that, that sentence, because, because the word orders aren't exactly the same across. So in Japanese, I said before, you know, in English, you say, what, what I said was the boy, you know, the, 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 uh, the cat that the dog chased ran away. Well, the word order for that relative clause, that's clause modifying a, a noun in English, comes after the head noun, comes after dog in English. Well, it comes before the noun in Japanese, and that ends up being... You, 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 those those kinds of clauses don't end up being nested in Japanese. They end up being uh, all local dependencies. And so you can just that that easy that way we were saying that awful sentence before is very easy to say in Japanese uh, in, in this, this simple word order. But what that means is like what's kind of interesting. But so all languages tend to minimize dependency distances. They all do that. And so the kinds of structures that they tend to use will vary slightly in, in sort of complex situations like that. So it's not like you can't say that thing, but there's, a, there's probably a situation where it might be useful for me to want to say that crazy sentence that I said before, which was the cat that the dog, which John owned, chased, ran away. That's a complicated, when would that situation be reasonable? Well, there'd have to be like two, two dogs and two cats, one that, you know, that John owned and someone else owned. And I have to be able to tell you, otherwise, why am I telling you that this is the one that John owned as opposed to someone else? And so I, it's a weird situation, but in, in Japanese, it would be really easy to produce that. In English, it's just really hard no matter what. You know, you'd say it a different way in English. That same idea, you would just, you know, introduce this dog and, and, and then just talk about that dog as in a different way. You wouldn't do it. It's like, no, we can't talk about it. There'd just be different syntactic structures that we use in English versus Japanese to talk about the same events. So that's kind of neat though, but, but so we use, what I, what I find totally, found totally fascinating is that, um, well, so the idea there was that it was just dependency distances in, in back in 1998 and 2000. And that has been a very nice generalization. I'm, I'm not saying it's, I mean, I, I've been telling my students this, like, I'm not, I'm not saying this is right. I'm not sure if it's the right theory of of the human mind and cognition and how that's actually working. But it's a really nice generalization, which helps me keep track of a lot of behavioral phenomena in a really compressed way. And so I, I think that's what a good theory is. A good theory helps me compress tons of phenomena in a really simple way so that I can sort of guess, you know, when I see some new new material, some new items, I can guess probably how those will be, under, how those will be produced and understood. And dependency length minimization does really well at that. It, it just does a really good job. It's not necessarily how it's being implemented in the brain in some way or other. You know, it might be an abstraction over these neural net, you mentioned neural networks. I think the neural networks kind of implement them in some way. I think this is like an abstraction over how neural networks are kind of, is it local, it's just locality, right? If there's some abstraction. And so this is like an abstraction of how, I think maybe the right story, if we're gonna get into this at some point, the right story might be a neural net, you know, neural net, so, something like these deep neural nets we can talk about that. You know, I actually think those are much more plausibly the more on heading towards the right story of how human language is represented in our minds and brains. But dependency length, you know, talking about dependencies is a beaut is a really nice abstraction over that information so that I so that I can convey this to other humans. Like telling you that it's a dependence that it's a deep neural net and, and there's all this training that goes on and there's you know this many layers and and, and you need this much you know, training to get this this is a success that doesn't help you understand how it's going to how how that that network is going to process something. It's it's just not it's too complicated for us to. I mean, I just don't know by looking at a network how it's going to work. But I can tell you these generalizations. Once we explain dependency length 
minimization dependency length cost, then you you can you'll have a good intuition about what might be complicated and and easy for for the network and for humans maybe if if those things are similar. There's a lot of really interesting things to dive into here, and one of them that I think we kind of skirted around, but that you do approach very clearly in a lot of these works is the sort of different components of sentence parsing. So one is the structural integrations that you've talked about, and then the other is just keeping a structure in memory. If I am kind of elaborating on, you know, the awful sentence you talked about earlier, I kind of have to remember, well, what was the thing I was talking about in the first place? And I think that this also kind of results in a lot of grammatical mistakes people might make. For example, when nothing's coming to mind right now as far as examples, but people might get kind of confused about whether I'm referring to a singular versus a plural and then use kind of the wrong type of verb, for instance, in doing that. And the fact that there's just such a long dependency between the the subject that I was referring to and then what I'm using to describe it later kind of creates a bit of a difficulty for me in figuring out what is the right way to properly continue this sentence. And so could you talk a little bit more about these sort of different components of sentence parsing, the integration part, and then the memory cost as well? Yeah, so that was... Um... So you're, you're you're sort of referring to the 1988 1998 paper, which is the syntactic predict. It was called I can't remember what the paper's called, but it's about that that hypothesis. And um, yeah, the idea there was that there's uh, maybe two two costs associated with with processing language, just holding on to the syntactic structure you've got so far, and then connecting the the word in. And and I've focused so far when when I'm talking you just the last few minutes is really about the connection part, the integration cost. When you get a new word, so if I hear, you know, if I get that one, not terribly complicated sentence, but if I said the cat, you know, which, the dog, and now I get, then I get chased, okay? And now I have to hook chased up to both um, uh, cat, which is right local, cat, um, sorry, dog, dog chased, cat, dog is right beside chased. And then cat is kind of further back, the that or the which or something kind of refers to that. And so there's like, there's some integration cost, the claim is, uh, the claim is that there's some, well, that's the, there's a dependency there that goes between those two things. And I have to make that link if I'm going to build it, if I'm going to understand the sentence, the claim is, I got to build this representation in some way or other. And, and the very simple representation here is just connecting those, I got to connect those two words somehow, I got to interpret them relative to one another. And, and, the, and the claim is just that the further back in the input it is, the more difficulty I'll have in finding that in that m- making that connection that's like so it's a memory story it's a, and so then we can ask questions about how that works is that you know why why is that hard is it and, and uh, you know maybe there's like direct access in the memory and i can actually really directly access and maybe this is so it's not really a problem of finding that pre previous thing maybe the problem is there might be interfering similar things that makes it hard there's like a lot of potentially different sources of a difficulty there and 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 some research has suggested that it's really the 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 stuff in between the interference of the of the words in between which might affect the so it's not like we, it's hard to find that previous thing the problem is there's other things in between which also get in the way which like get make it kind of confusing for your for your mind to to find those so that's interference that's an interference story as opposed to an access story it's not and so the, and then and there's like ways to tell that apart uh, um by varying the kinds of materials that people look at um to people read or, or or understand and so but the story i thought so i think it's mostly about the things in between which are causing the difficulty and and finding the right place because there's something like there's just two things that are too similar that are bothering me and think maybe that one goes there instead so if i if you put noun phrases that are kind of similar to one another in a row, you'll you, you'll probably get the intuition that they they sound a lot. They're harder. So if I say something like, so that's why if I if I use a pronoun for example in the middle, it doesn't sound so bad. If I say you know the book, um, or if I do something like the book that the author wrote um, was was four hundred pages. That's um, easy. I mean, it's a very local relative clause there. It's what's well, an object relative clause. But then, now I can actually add another noun phrase in there and see what happens. So if I say the book that the author um, who the interviewer talked to, okay, I'm having a hard time even producing this now. So, uh, so 
interview talked to the, the book with the author no they say wrote was 400 pages like i can't, can't even do that it's very very difficult so i added a nut like a, a book and then i have author and then i have interviewer and those author and interviewer are like almost the same they're two humans they can both do these things and so it's very confusing trying to figure out what, what to do with these verbs at the end but if i change it to the the book that the author who i met wrote you know was 400 pages or something like that that's easier because maybe there's aspects of i who i met versus who the interviewer met interviewer and author are very similar and i have syntactically is very different from 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 author it has like different kinds of properties pronouns look different like they look different we represent them probably differently in some way and so people there's, there's like behavioral evidence we can go to in that and, to, and so like the more similar those nouns are the worse these things get people have a harder harder time understanding them. And so that suggests that it's got to do with the interference of the stuff in between. Now, regarding the storage, you were mentioning a cold, holding on. There's like, that's, there's, that's complicated. Uh, you know, that was a story that I made back then in 1988, that maybe there's storage cost. And I think more, you know, over, over time, we've, we're, we're not really sure what the representations are that are being stored. Uh, and, and even, so the most recent work, I would say, suggests the best work suggests that the, um, what we're doing when we're remembering structure, we are remembering something of the structure, but we're we're doing it in a noisy way. We're not we're not doing it perfectly, and we're we're trying we're always trying to reconstruct what what was pro so the the story back then was it's remembered remembered perfectly, and there's some cost associated with that remembering remembering it perfectly, and maybe there's something associated. And I, I think that's not right. Probably what's right is there's um, we 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 always are trying to. We, we get some finite memory and we're, we're roughly remembering what's going on and we're always trying to um, reconstruct what was probably said. So it's a, the, the, the story here is that you actually never have a perfect representation for, maybe you have a perfect representation for very simple sentences, but for, for longer materials with more than a few words, more than, uh, you know, then you, you, you're always roughly reconstructing what was prob probably said to, to, to build your own meaning of that. And, and there's the evidence in support of that kind of a claim is that in, in these complicated materials, it comes from a lot of different kinds of complicated materials such that um, there is related to the kinds of examples you were talking about, but I'm not exactly sure if those are the same phenomenon going on there, but we were talking about agreement, you know, subject verb agreement and so on. But here's like in, in these complicated sentences that I'm talking about. So the, the, if I say, you know, the dog, no, the cat which the dog chased ran away. The, and then now I say the cat which the dog who who John owned ran away. Um, it doesn't sound so bad. It strangely doesn't sound so bad, even though it doesn't make sense. I, I left off chased. What I should have said there is the dog, the, the, the cat which the dog... Uh, the cat which the dog which John owned chased ran away. That's the full sentence I should have said. But if you leave off that intermediate verb there, these things sometimes they often sound a little better. And 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 the, so what we think may be going on there, which is like that's those are un, technically speaking sort of ungrammatical. You know, I mean, I should you know be careful about what what does that even mean? You know, what is the grammar? Right, that's a big question actually. So, but. People like if we're thinking of these, there, there being rules associated with this. A noun needs a verb to go with it. There's a there's a noun there has no verb that goes with it at all. If I say you know the the dog, no the cat which the dog, which John owned ran away, it sort of sounds like an okay sentence in some way, but I didn't link up dog and cat in any way. There was no there was no no verb there to connect those two. And somehow when you ask people to read these kinds of materials. Um, or, or, or complete them. We have different kinds of behavioral measures here of humans, um, or actually do them in neural nets, actually, have these big, you know, fancy um, current um, neural nets like ChatGPT or something, they will often make mistakes and leave off an intermediate verb, uh, which is kind of, so suggesting there's some sort of lossy representation of what's, of, of this complicated structure beforehand. And what Richard Futrell and Michael Hahn have sort of worked on trying to figure that out. And they've figured out that maybe what's going on is you've got a, a, a lossy, lossy representation of what, what was already there. And you're trying to re reconstruct it based on what's probably most likely. So you'll remember salient parts of it, like very memorable components like the nouns. 
the the, the nouns in there and the in the verbs in some ways in the, in the proceeding, but you'll forget things like the, the 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 things that are very predictable from their local environments. Things like a word like that and a word like of a word like the. These words are not. You can usually reconstruct those. They're predictable from their local nouns. But if you get if I hear reporter, or I hear desk, or I hear you know dog. I'll probably, you know, even though those seem like kind of common words, they're a lot less common than words like that and of and the, which are, you know, so the, they're common nouns, but they're still kind of unpredictable in normal context. But the, ver the, the function words are very, are, are actually are much, much more common. And so people tend to forget those, we think, and then reconstruct according to more likely syntactic structures. And so what, what Richard would have thought was maybe what's going on there is you hear that that, you know, the, the dog, you know, which the, um, the cat, which the dog, which the man, and maybe you just think one of those witches was a mistake and you maybe thought it was, you know, with instead of which is actually pretty close in terms of sounds here. And maybe, and then, and then you don't need this extra verb, right? And so that's a more, a much more likely, um, um, initial sequence than having all these, you know, noun phrases connected with clauses. And so that's, so, so I think that's the best current story actually of what's going on is that we don't have a perfect representation at all. And, and we're, and, and we're, we're still trying to figure out, um, you know, how that representation, you know, what, what, what are the details of that representation? But I think that's, this is like this guy Futrell and uh, Michael Hahn, they have like nice theories of, of that, I think. And they're working at these, they, they, you know, we're, Scientists and scientists typically work with weird materials to try to figure out how the how the machine works, right? If we we, we don't have access to how the mind's working here, and so we we give it weird materials um, that can inform us about how that structure, how that thing might be running, and so that we think that it's sort of a, a lossy, a lossy memory is what we think is going on there. Yeah, one one thing that keeps coming up for me when I think about language processing and processing difficulty is a lot of the sentences that you brought up as examples that we've talked about thus far, they can be difficult to parse, but more or less, they're all sentences that if I were reading them, I would just kind of linearly go from beginning to end. And I wouldn't have to do a lot of jumping around, I think, to make sense of the sentence. And this isn't always the case. I think I often encounter sentences when reading. I can think of particular authors who I think abuse this a lot where I'll be in the middle of the sentence, there's like the beginning of a phrase, and then kind of separated by M dashes is another very long sentence, or maybe it's in a parenthetical or something. And so it just kind of takes me someplace completely different. And then we kind of come back and continue what was going on in the first place. And I think this has a lot to do, or what's going on a lot in the difficulty there is this memory cost, for example, I'm having to sort of switch to thinking about maybe a completely different topic if it's in a parenthetical, and then kind of come back and remember, okay, what was I reading about in the first place again? But one thing that's interesting to me about this is often my, and I imagine other people's strategies for actually parsing these sentences tends to change in that I don't kind of just read the strength sentence straight from beginning to end. I will often like bracket things off, for instance, or I will kind of intuitively like shave off parts of the sentence that seem unimportant. And I think that this helps, for me at least, to reduce a lot of that memory cost, a lot of the integration cost we've spoken of before. But I'm curious how you think about just this aspect of, well, people might not always read things linearly in order to parse some of these really difficult sentences, and kind of how that interacts with some of these locality theories and, and the difficulties associated with difficult sentences. Well, the... The question that we're trying to figure out, that I'm trying to figure out in my sort of broad community is trying to figure out is how is language typically produced and understood in, in general? And you can always, you can, I can, and I have construct complicated materials to try to get at, like basically they can form that question, you know, uh, and that's what these very complicated so-called center embedded or nested structures, that, that's one kind of material that is useful in helping figure out how people typically understand non-center embedded sentences, normal sentences. <clears throat> so the fact that some, um, it doesn't, we, we're not particularly interested in reading. Reading is a, turns out to be a nice 
measure, provides a nice measure of difficulty in some ways. Um, but, you know, there's like different ways to, like, we don't have to look at reading, we can look at listening to speech as well. It's wh where you don't have like, so you're talking about maybe if a writer happens to write with long distance dependencies in some way with nested structures, then there might be strategies to over to make that easier to understand. That's certainly true. I, I mean, I think that's true. I, I mean, that might not tell us much about how um, people are typically writing and typically producing and particularly comprehending language, which, which is what I want to know. Uh, like, how do you get around this, you know, as a, as a reader? Well, there might be, I don't, I don't, I don't know why a writer would do that. You know, I don't know why exactly. I mean, this is like, a, I, we have another whole, I have another whole topic of, of, of research, which is about legalese. I don't know if I sent you something about this is trying to understand the nature of legalese in, in, in American law. And I don't know how general this is across other other kinds of um, languages, but I, I think it may be general across these other languages where they leg, legal writers tend to write in center embedded structures, which is kind of interesting. And this is maybe part of the reason that legalese is so hard to understand. Everyone knows that legalese is hard to understand. Why is it hard to understand? You know, so going back to the plain language, there's a, something called the plain language movement, which has been going on in legalese for since 1970 under, under Richard Nixon and various presidents. You know, Carter brought it up after after Nixon, and then um, it was big on Obama. Did it again? Year, you know, years later, and you know, everyone knows legalese is awful to read, but they don't understand why. And it turns out we we were like kind of recently. This guy Eric Martinez works with me. He's a lawyer, actually. He's a lawyer. Worked, and he um, we figured out that a lot of what makes legalese hard to understand is it's it is nested, it's center embedded, so it's there. And that's a really interesting question: is like why. Well, we can we can always write a center embedded sentence in a non center embedded way. That's kind of what I was alluding to very early on. English, you can write if you if you want to for some. What, there might be a function to writing it that way. I don't really. We, we're still figuring out the function for legalese. Why it is that it's written there like like that way, and it and then that, there's a lot of interesting questions about whether. But it's very hard for everyone to understand. It's hard for you to understand. Presumably, it's hard for me. It's hard for legal experts. It's hard for lawyers. Lawyers have exactly the same behavioral problems as we have in understanding those things. And so, we're, the reason I bring this up is like, well, language. You know, we can look at natural language, and it turns out all natural languages that have been investigated thus far, and I guess we've got about 70 or 80 of them, is like I should say all, I don't know how well this is gonna to generalize to all 7,000, but we have 70 or 80 in you know co populations where, where, where people have done, have coded the dependency structures, like the, the very rough syntactic structure of what people write in that language. And the reason they do, they do it for writing for the most part is because that's what's out there and natural language processing people can can parse that fastest and easiest rather than jumping right into the speech realm. But there's some of these have big texts of spoken language as well. And, and we, we can parse those in dependency structure also. And every language minimizes dependency lengths to some degree. Like every, in, the, in the way that people typically write, every single language. And so how, how do you find this out? Well, this guy, Richard Futrell, the same guy I was referring to before, he figured out, well, we can just take these texts from 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 whatever people are using in the parse text, and we can take for the dependency structure for any sentence, for any utterance, we can take the dependency structure. So if I get like a, you know, Mary kicked the ball, let's do the simple one rather than these very complicated ones. And so there, kicked is the head. It's a kicking event. Mary's the agent, ball is the patient. And so the dependency structure goes, kick is the head, you know, Mary's to the left and depends on kick and ball is to the right and depends on kick and the depends on, on ball. Okay, it's a very forward thing. And, and that's how you happen to say it in English for that material, for that sentence. Um, you can take, for any sentence, you can take the root there. There's always a root. It turns out that any for any structure in any language, they're, it, they're, they're, they happen to be um, trees. They happen to be directed acyclic graphs where there's a root and, um, and, and, the, and it goes down to leaves. So you can take it, and so that, that's what a dependency structure is for, um, for any sentence. So you can do that for this one, the, the Mary kicked the ball. So it, what, what Richard did was to say, well, let's just take the root and, and, um, and, and then we'll see for all of its dependents here, there's just two dependents. We can scramble them randomly. We'll take a random order of those. We, we wanna get a baseline for how 
how local the dependencies are in English, say, to how they might have been for some other language, for some other non-human language in a way, or just some some control. And so we just like take that and scramble them in some random order. You got three things there. You got a head and you got two dependents. You got Mary, Ball, and Kick, and you got the set down below, right? And then you scramble them in some random order. It, and there's six of them, I guess. There's three there. You can do the six ways. And then and then just do that all the way down the tree. And there's like the and ball has to be done as well. Okay. So it's a very short sentence. There's not much to be done here. And then you can imagine for a long sentence with you know 20 or 30 words, there's just a lot of this to do. It's the same kind of thing. Maybe you'll have three dependents or uh, of a particular word, or maybe you have two, and you just do this all the way down the tree. And, and what he does, it does this a hundred times for any sentence to get kind of like, oh, oh, and then we can see what the what the dependency lengths are for those non-English things. And we can see what the, what the dependencies are there compared to for the actual sentences that occurred. And it turns out that in every language, the dependency lengths that occur are much shorter than, the, than, than this control, than this kind of control. And you can make it an even more, con, a, a more constrained control by uh, disallowing cross dependencies. Okay, so like it turns out that language, human is a good, another, I gave you one generalization about human language, which is that. It's it's a directed acyclic graph generally. Every almost any you know any sentence is a directed acyclic graph. There's a there's a head thing and it goes down to the leaves, which are the trees. And so and so so for for a word, sorry for a sentence, you got n words. So say you got 20 words, a long sentence. You have 19 connections, n minus one connections. And one of those things is the head of the whole sentence, and you can make this sort of mobile like you know off that off that head. Um, and um, and then it turns out that human languages don't like cross dependencies. They, they tend not to be crossed in, in those structures. So one is directed acyclic graph. Two, those things don't cross. That's called projectivity. You know, they, that, that's just a word that math people use for what that is. So these are projective trees, is or to, to, project, to projective um, acyc, directed acyclic graphs. And so human language tends to be. They, 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 if you just choose any of these, I don't know how many 60 or 70 languages that have been analyzed now, every single one of them has much local, much more local dependencies than are than in, than even a projective version, a control. Like projective, turns out projective languages are happen to also have much shorter dependencies than non-projective. If you're allowed to cross dependencies, things can get kind of wacky with really long sentences. You can get very long. But if you constrain them to disallow that, because human languages don't allow that. Even there, human languages are still more local than the projective baseline. So that's what Richard observed. Um, so human languages, like in general, so you know, there, there may be writers there, and I'm like, this is kind of interesting. It's like the legalese, going back to this, they kind of don't do that. And I don't know why, you know, legalese is the weirdest case of all. That's like across the whole profession, they write with much longer dependencies. I don't know what they are relative to their controls. I should, we should compare that. I could compare like their corpus against you know uh, uh against a you know projective conservative baseline and see which is worse to see if if they, the way they write is is worse um i mean but for random text other than legalese <laughs> uh people tend to minimize dependency so what do you do when you run into this you notice you need a strategy because it's not normal right it isn't normal like you, you have to do some something special here you're not just reading this text you have to invoke some strategy to fix this problem that you're noticing, right? Because it's not its not something you can just do um, while, while uh, pro pro processing language normally. So in my speech and in your speech and everything, we're, if we transcribed all this, the dependencies be, would be overwhelmingly local. Even if I have a very long sentence, it's going to be, so say that I have a long sentence with 20 words in it, the dependency distance will, will average, it'll be just over one. Almost all the words will be right beside each other that connect to one another. And, and if you figure you know not all language needs to be like legal i said mentioned legal language isn't like that um, um you can write poetry that's not like that you know so you can write language which serves some other function so if you go to like latin which has a kind of a free word order um it does have a kind of a free word order and in some old examples of the poetry there there's a lot of cross dependencies so there's other kinds of construction other kinds of constraints on what makes language language and so you know mo if it's just about communication then we're going to have close dependencies. People are going to produce what's easier. But if it's about poetry, well, there's other constraints. I mean, the constraint is not to convey some meaning in the shortest, easiest way as possible. You know, then I might want some nice rhythmic structure and some rhymes and things. And so then I'm going to move the words around in a way which might be very awkward syntactically, but we'll make some other point. You know, we'll make some other, and it's probably, 
for most humans, it's very difficult to generate, right? It's not something I can do, uh, you know, on the fly by, you know, just by speaking off the top of my head, I'm going to have to like, you know, you know, kind of what you were saying, sort of build some other strategy here for, for doing the generation there in that part. For me, certainly, I mean, you know, uh, probably for most people, that's a really hard thing to do is to generate, you know, beautiful poetry in some way or other. It's not, I mean, maybe there's some, that's an interesting other research question, but uh, it's probably not general. It's not our question. So my question is mostly about how random people process human language. And it turns out that almost all human language has local dependencies, which is really cool. I mean, I find that very interesting. Yeah. So I think this is a good place to get into some other work and maybe prep the way for I feel like this really nicely segues into some of the stuff we're going to talk about later about language as communication. But first, you've also done this really interesting work on understanding how words get brought into a language. And you have this story of the utility of words, sort of, are they useful depending on what a particular culture wants to talk about? And in 2008, Michael C. Frank with you uh, published this paper on number as a cognitive technology studying the Paraha language, which really interestingly, I guess, doesn't have words for numbers. And that has some sort of influence on the way that they're processing words in that respect. But one really interesting thing that comes up in this paper that I wanted to ask you about to start with is that it notes the evidence studied in that paper argues against the strong Worfian claim that language for number creates the concept of exact quantity. And I'm wondering if with that as a starting point, you could talk a little bit about how you think about the Worf hypothesis a little bit more broadly. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, a, a segue, a big segue here. So the, uh, so you know, so my background, I, I mentioned I'm a math, I was a math and CS person as an, as an undergrad. I've always just sort of, that's kind of what I am. I'm sort of a, a math and CS kind of engineering kind of person. And so, uh, and I got into lang sentence language processing and because uh, I was just interested in this problem of, you know, how the language, how, how do people produce and understand language? And that just seemed like a really neat problem. And it led to this problem of potentially why languages look the way they do, you know? And so why maybe that the, the, the reason languages look the way they do is because this is a communication basic idea is that is, is because of what's easier and hard for us to understand. And so we'll, we'll get into that, but then I like that's then I'm sort of working on not just in the level of, I mean, structure is really interesting. Syntactic structure. So dependency structure is, a, is probably the most uh, argued about topic in sort of linguistics maybe, uh, but it, there's a it, language is more broad than just putting words together, right? It's the words themselves as well. So the the what what are like language is not just um, connections between words. It's the words, you know. We and so a from a sort of very functionalist point of view, um, we can talk about we can think about what what is what is human language and why do we have it, right? And and so one idea is that uh, we invent words for the things that we want to talk about. So we, we are very complex organisms who can think about complicated events, but the language that we use may be according to what we need to convey to other people in some way or other. And so the, that, that's, so the, the number paper here and this color thing we're going to talk about maybe in a minute is like, they're, they're kind of related in that way in that maybe what's going on here is you're inventing labels for things that we need to convey to other people. And so then number is a really interesting domain. These are both interesting domains, color domain, and, and these, are just, these are just word domains, but they're kind of abstract uh, properties of cognition. Both of them are. Right? So what is number for that sake? It's such a fascinating topic. Like the word one is such an interesting word. And then the word 17 is an interesting word. It's an abstract property of a set. It's not, it doesn't refer to anything. It, it refers to an abstract property of sets. And so why, like, then the question is, you might, I think a standard view is a, a previous view to ours in some ways is, is that uh, all languages have these because all, maybe all, all humans have these concepts and they just try to figure, you know, just, then they just need to figure out, maybe those are innate. I think it's a sort of a standard overview uh, that, that these concepts are innate 
And then what we do is label those concepts. We learn labels for them. And, and the Pierre Ha was a really neat test case of that kind of a of question. It was are they, turns out they don't have words for number at all, like any words for numbers at all, like not even a word for one. And, and anyone who hasn't heard this before will just not believe me and think it's crazy because it doesn't make sense in our culture in a way. And so let me just go through the experiments that sort of show this, okay? And so it's like, if you just give them <laughs> Um, a, a set of objects, okay? And so what we had at the time, I was visiting the Piranha, it's a hunter-gatherer um, group in in, um, in Brazil, in, in the Amazon, in, in um, Amazonian Brazil. It's about, at the time, it was about 800 in the total community. And it's an isolate language uh, and an isolate group who doesn't interact much with pretty much anyone else outside of their community. And they've been there for a very, very long time. We don't know how long, but hundreds of years, like at least 200 years since they were first known about it, but probably they've been there many, many, you know, centuries before that. Uh, and, and there's no, it's an isolate language. We don't even know as fat, you know, these, these kinds of areas like um, Amazonia, the geographical area is such that it hasn't changed in thousands of years. And so people can, and, and it's, so they don't have hurricanes, they don't have earthquakes, they don't have anything that affects how they can live. They can just stay there for very, very long periods of time. There's no drought, you know, so there's no reason to move. So people can live there for hundreds and thousands of years. And so people can grow in these communities separate and uh, just be there and, and be fine on their own. And that's, that's our best guess as to why there are so many isolate communities in like these in populations within the Amazonian rainforest. There's still lots and many that have not even been, you know, have not interacted with um, uh, you know, industrialized Brazil, you know, and, and I think, they're, I think they're all in Brazil. The ones that are undocumented yet are still just in Brazil, as opposed to the other parts of the Amazon, which is like Peru and Bolivia and, and Colombia and stuff. And so, um, anyway, these guys are, they were isolate. And I had a friend of mine, Dan Everett was a guy on my, um, PhD committee. Actually, he was one of my co-advisors of my PhD committee from, he was at University of Pittsburgh when I was at uh, Carnegie Mellon getting my PhD. And he invited me down to um, work with this group uh, to because he is making claims about them not having numbers. And actually, he had another claim about not, not having syntactic embedding, which is a very, another whole topic, <laughs> which is called recursion, which is a fascinating topic, but it's a different topic. Um, and and we, we did both, we started trying to study the recursion problem, which is a very hard problem. Uh, but we also did study the number problem. And the number problem, you can give people um, a set of objects. We had spools of thread that were identical and they were familiar with. They're identical, you know, they they're happen to be all the same size. Just, you, you can just imagine sort of big beads is fine. Anything which is kind of identical. And we sort of just put one down in front of them and say, describe this. You could put two down and say, describe this. Like, just say, what is this? What is this? What is this for sets going from one all the way up to 10? And then for a set of one, they would use a particular word. They always use the same head noun for this thing, this spool of thread. I can't remember what that word was, but they would use a particular word for um, what we thought was one at the time. And I frankly can't remember the morphemes for these right now. I I, 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 uh, I can't remember any of these morphemes anymore, these words for these particular words. But anyways, it was one, it was meant one. Another one we, we, we thought was two, which have been documented as being two, and another one that uh, we thought was was many. Okay, so there was like words. It was documented as a language that had one, two, and many. And and sure enough, if we we asked I don't know five or ten people, we recorded all this and asked them to just label these sets of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. It's it frankly it's a weird task. If you only have three labels for sets, then it's an odd task. Once they start using many, and you say they start using many at four and you give them five and you give them six and you give them seven, it's like, it's many every single time they look at me like I'm an idiot. I told you that was many and you gave them another one. And so it's, it's a little weird. It's all right. They, they understand they're trying to teach us their language. And so they understand that, you know, I might do some silly things at times when I'm trying to do that. And so it was a kind of a funny interaction. Uh, and so they would all do this one. So one, two, and many sort of roughly the same word all the time for one, the same word, for around two or three, some small set, and then four or more, they would typically say, they would say many around four. But then you do the same exact task now on the same people and start instead of with one up to 10, do 10 down to one, okay? Just the same task. And then remarkably, they would start at, instead of switching at, um, you, know, you know, around three or four, 
they would start switching at seven, you know, that you'd start like 10 is many, many, many. And then at seven or something that, you know, or, or maybe even eight, they'd start saying few. We thought was, well, we thought was two. It's not two. It's few. It's something, it's not even few. It's like some, that middle word is something like some. And then they'd start saying one. We thought was one at, 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 at as low, as high as six. And, and, and almost everyone is saying it at four. And so it's, it's not one, two, and many. It's few. Many is correct. Few and many. And then something like some. They don't have any exact numbers at all. It's just few, many, uh, a few, some, and many is what those three, three words meant. And everyone did the same thing. I mean, there was like little variants about, um, you know, where they would switch from few to some or from, you know, many, from some to many. These things were like their noise there. But only those three words. And, all, and and never people would go down to one. They would always, you know, start using one at something like six or something. And then, and by four, they're always using one. So it's not one. So, and, and, and they all did it. And then and you could do another task with them. So then we could like try and see if they don't have number of words, which they don't, it seems like they don't even have a word for one, which is kind of incredible. You know, how, how do they keep track of sets of objects? Well, they don't. And, and, and so if we gave them a set of objects now and asked them, to put, so we, we put down, say, I put down three spools of thread in front of them. And then I put, I give them a bunch of, of balloons. We had uninflated red balloons. We were using those, very easy to manipulate, easy to put on this table that we were using. And and so they would, they, they just, the task was put one balloon against each one of my um, uh, spools of thread. And, 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 and you can, it's easy to do for any, you know, any set size, you can do that. You don't have to count to do that. If I put three down, if I put down 10, you just put one against another. There's no reason to count. It's just a, it's, can you understand it's a one-to-one -one task? And they were perfectly able to do this, no problem. Um, then we do the same task with, but, but then I hide it. So I put down three and then I hide the thing with a, you know, opaque surface of some kind. And then they have to like, just put them where they were. So they understand the task because they can do the exact matching task when they're there. So they know what to do. And, and you can do it very easily for two, two, three, and four. They can still do that because it's easy to remember where those things were. But as soon as it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, it's like really hard without counting to do that, without being without keeping tr like like seven doesn't look very different from eight or six. They look visually very similar to most people who haven't got a lot of practice. And I mean, even with a lot of practice, it's hard to keep track of what seven looks like compared to what eight looks like. And so um if you don't have some way to encode that set, which is a, a, a very quick abstraction, which is what counting is, which is what we will do, we'll count them seven. I can put down seven, no problem. Get them, get them perfect. Um, then they, um, you know, we, we will get this right every time. They get it. They would get it. Uh, they would do it approximate after four. So they put down five instead of four sometimes, and you know, six instead of seven, or seven instead of eight, or eight instead of seven, all the way up to ten. And they're always doing it approximately, and. Uh, so that's that's the so th that work shows that they just don't have any exact number words, like at all. Which is kind of that was like it's always surprising to many to people. People like in industrialized communities like ours, we just think it's bizarre that they wouldn't have words for these because it's just so useful for us to be able to count. It's, and it's I mean this is what we think. Uh, this is now we're into theory, right? And, and try to figure out why that is. My our guess is it's because of what's useful utility. You know, is it use? So is it useful for them to count? Well. There's not really any value in their community for being able to count. As people would often ask me, well, don't they, um, what about uh, sharing um, food with their community? So you go hunting or you go fishing, you bring back a bunch of fish, you bring back some you know, fruit or something off, off trees and stuff, um, you know, bring it back and you want to share it among your community. You want to share it among the whole village or you want to share it among your family. You know, and, and, and the thing is natural objects aren't identical. <laughs> so, so there's no reason to have an exact count for this. So what I mean by that is say you go and catch four fish. Well, one of them is bigger than the other three and the other, and, and yeah, that's, they're all different in sizes. So, so it doesn't, or maybe you catch six fish. You know, what matters is the volume of fish, not the count. The count is, a, is, is useless for, in, in natural objects. It doesn't, doesn't help you. And so, you, yes, sharing is important, but then the way you share is by sort of trying to give the same amount of stuff to everyone as opposed to the count is, is useful for us because we have industrialized objects which are identical and we want to, and it's, it's a good, very fast way to give people exactly the same quantities. But in the natural world, there's nothing like that. Uh, and then, and then there was, people would also ask me also about, you know, oh, you say they have they, they have a lot of children. These these the, the families there would have four, five, six kids sometimes. And well, don't they 
want to keep track of their children using count words. And, and I, I'm like, well, anytime someone asks me that, I always say, well, do you have any children? And the answer is almost invariably no. And so it's some abstract idea. I'm like, anyone who has kids knows that that's not how you keep track of your kids. Like you don't keep track of your kids by like, I go down, I go to sleep at night. I have five kids. I go in the room next door and there, I want to make sure there's still five kids here. So I count them. You, you care who they are, right? Their, their identities are very important here. So it's not just the number of children you want to make sure is there. You want to make sure it's the same children. And so I need to know it's, you know, all my, the names are very important there for that, but not, and so then like, that that's not useful. And so, you know, they just don't, that's a, so this is just a guess. Or this is our guess as to where that was coming from. Okay. So maybe they're inventing, and, and then others have, have hypothesized this, that maybe that the numbers get invented, the words discovered, numbers, whatever invented, words, I guess, number words get invented, discovering what numbers are that counts of maybe through farming, through having things like goats, having a bunch of goats, and you go to bed, and you get up in the morning, if you have 15 goats, you know, it is a very fast way to make sure you've got kind of the same goats there. It's someone might have taken one of them and replaced them with another and you wouldn't really care, right? I mean, it's not very important to making sure your, your flock is still there. But um, but that's not true of your family, right? You you do care that the individuals are there. The goats, maybe you don't care as much. And so the an idea out there is that maybe through farming, people invented, discovered that labeling is important. Now, so this is all about our, our idea about utility. And you asked me about wharf, you know? So wharf is a different question. So the wharf question is, you know, does the language that you speak somehow affect um, the way that you perceive or conceive of the world in some way? And so I'm, I am not a Worfian, I would say in general, I, I'd say mostly no is the answer to that. And so we were like there, um, I, I think most of the evidence in that, in that domain is weak for Worfian, so-called Worfian effects. So this is going back to this guy, Benjamin Worf, was actually a, an MIT student. I was I'm at MIT. He was a student. He was a chemical engineer, I think, at MIT. He's a he very smart guy and did a lot of inter he has some interesting, very interesting, um, neat ideas and stuff. But I, I think the effects of of language on thinking, I think, are overrated. Uh, um, you know, I, I think you know they maybe languages kind of draw attention to sort of different ways of cutting the world in some way or others, but. But, but I think most, like, like the way I think about language is about communication. So, so the things that we want to talk about, we will invent words for, you know, it's, but, but the, but the thinking is kind of independent of that. Um, you know, so that, you know, and so then if we have stuff that we need to talk about, then we will invent the words for those, those things. And so that's, that's kind of how I, I, I think about now with respect to number, how does number play into this? I mean, Number is kind of the most one of the most interesting Worfian kinds of questions where the best theory of how numbers sort of get invented is one where you kind of need the labels in some ways, maybe to figure out um, the, the what, what number the, there's there's this the interesting thing about numbers, right, is that there's a recursive count list. That's the kind of really. So there's a lot of interest. It's interesting that, you know, there's there's one, two, three, four, but it goes all the way to as high as you want. Right. And so how to. You know, how do kids learn that? How do you, you know, how does that happen? And, and the sort of the best theory out there is one where you kind of need the labels to, that you need the labels for the words in order for the learning to sort of work really well. And that's a guy called Steve Candidosti kind of, it's sort of based on something that Sue Carey, her ideas roughly, although she doesn't think Steve Candidosti's implementation is quite right, but I think it's pretty reasonable of the, anyway, that there, there you kind of maybe need the words to be able to conceive of the idea of recursive count lists as a like maybe they you know people can understand what one and two and three is without knowing you know with just the words those those things that, that those kinds of concepts but understanding what 15 is you kind of need the labels to be able to get there maybe but but i don't know if that's a really a, a very interesting case in some way of warfianism of of warf like the warfian claim is supposed to be the strong interesting claim there is supposed to be that the, the, the structure of the language af affects the way that we process or, or, you know, in the strongest way we perceive the world, right? And so we know that in color, for example, there's lots of cultures which vary radically in their um, color labeling hierarchies. And so there's, there's cultures with two labels that, that people will use regularly, only things black and white, you know, things that are really kind of black and you know, kind of white, they'll label those. But they can see perfectly well. It's not like their color vision is no good. Their color vision is perfect. 
And so they can do, do, do the same kinds of um, color discrimination tasks as, as anyone with a very, with a much bigger vocabulary of color words could do. So it's not like the words in those cases plausibly, I mean, there's, there's ideas out there that maybe it affects something about the speed. There's a, there's a paper from a while ago suggesting that Russians process um, the border between blue and between light blue and dark blue a little bit different than English speakers do because they have words for light blue and dark blue. Um, but I, I, I actually am very dubious of that. We, we were unable to replicate this and extend it in any way. I think actually there's, there's just nothing there. Um, that would be fascinating if it were true. But I, I sort of like that sort of like do the word that's like words to the, the having words for things affect how you process them. Well, kind of, but not in a very interesting way, maybe, you know, if you, you know, an interesting way is like if we want to talk about that thing, then and we don't want to talk about it a lot, then, of course, you know, that, you know, those words will be helpful to us. But that's not maybe not what Worf meant, you know, and Worf it, going back to Worf, he was trying to talk about he was talking about his most interesting cases well one of them was about snow and that in in the inuit and he thought oh this they, they process snow very differently uh because they have so many words for snow that was his idea it was about the word the number of words that the inuit have for snow would affect how they process the snow and and, and it's it's not it's for fun thing, it's not even true and so you know english speakers have just the same number of words as as the uh, inuit have and uh you know probably be processed in exactly the same way i mean you know, how interesting is it to say that the Piraha, who you were referring to, who've never seen snow because they live right on the equator, they live one degree below, you know, they'll process snow very differently than a, than an Inuit speaker will. But that's because I've never seen it before. It's not about the words. That's about the concept. Right. So that's not I don't know. I think that's very interesting. And then hope in another case he was interested in was Hopi and, and the Hopi language, he thought, didn't um, have any tense in it. His, that was his idea that they didn't have any tense in this Native American language and therefore they didn't understand the concept of time. But that just turned out to be false. They do have tense and they do have time. And so it's just wrong. And so, uh, you know, of course, they process time. Of course, they understand what yesterday and tomorrow are. I mean, they, they get around in the world. They have to <laughs> they have to be able to understand. Like they may not have words for the things that aren't useful for them, but they do. They will they certainly understand what, you know, to the concepts of, you know, today and tomorrow are under reasonable, um, you know, under reasonable constraints. So I'm, I'm not a Worfian. Um, I, uh, I just think the evidence for Worfianism is very, very weak. Um, like, so of language, the language you speak affecting how you, how you um, think, you know, because I think language, well, I mean, I just think the evidence is weak. And I think that all leads to a conclusion that language and thought are really different things. And so, uh, so that does lead. So language is a communication system and thought is something else. Like thought is like how we get around in the world and what we want to do is like that's thinking and language is a communication system for that. And so when we, we invent things, we invent labels for things we, we, we want to talk about with, with other people about. Or, or maybe to ourselves, if you want to talk to yourself. I mean, it might be helpful as a mathematician, for example, right? If you're a math person, you invent concepts, you invent labels for things that you're going to be using over and over again. That's what math labels are. So maybe that's like, it doesn't have to be for someone else, it can just be for yourself. But you're inventing labels because it's easier, you know, for, to, to like to either communicate with yourself in the future or communicate with other people. That's the, I, that's what I think is the simplest, most obvious and probably right view of, of language in the mind. Yeah, with this as a segue, let's dive headfirst into that topic of language as communication. And maybe a place to start would be your 2013 PNAS paper with Bergson and Pianta Dosi about the experimental evidence for a proposal of how language comprehension works. Could you maybe introduce a little bit about this work and the proposal here? Sure, that's just taking... You know, Claude Shannon is the famous information theorist from 1948. And so he, he had this noisy channel language processing, you know, proposal for, you know, how communication works between two, um, between a comprehension, between a producer and, and, a, and a comprehender. They can be humans, they can be some other kind of system, doesn't really matter. And so, but for us, we're taking that very literally, um, uh, taking it as humans, like, like, like a human producer of language and a human comprehender of language. And he, with, with Shannon, you know, one of his big observations is that uh, this process of conveying a, a, a sig an idea, a concept from me to you is, is, is um, inherently 
you know, complicated because of the potential noise in the system. So we talked about is, a, is language processing is across a noisy channel. And so we're just like kind of elaborating that idea, um, you know, uh, and trying to um, spell that out in, in human language and try to see how that might um, apply. And so what, what we did, um, so this is actually building on work that a, a, a different person, Roger Levy. So a bunch of people have used noisy channel ideas in speech and have been using that idea for, for many, many years, going back through the 60s. And in, at the sentence level, it sort of was less, less um, used. And Roger Levy was kind of the first person. He's actually in my department, and he's the first person to sort of ap applying that at the sort of sentence level. And we were just kind of taking his observations, his idea, and try to spell that out, just try to see if we could test noisy channel um, predictions in language understanding in English and other languages. Okay. And, and all we did was um, look to see, look, look in English in every language has many ways of saying the same thing. You know, so we, 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 uh, we need to be flexible. Um, the, the language has to be flexible uh, because we are thinking about different things and we want to start from anywhere and go to go somewhere else. And so, so if I, back to my girl and ball and kicking and so on, if I want, if I'm talking about the girl and I'm saying, and, and, I'm, and I say the girls, kick, the girl kicked the ball, um, then, uh, you know, the easiest way to say that is probably, you know, I'm talking about a particular girl, I'll say she kicked the ball. Okay. I'm talking about her and probably the easiest way to refer to her as a pronoun rather than the whole, a full noun phrase, like, like, like the girl. And, and so then I'll use like a, a simple active clause there. She kicked the ball. But if I'm happy to be talking not about this girl at all, but I'm talking about the ball for some reason, and we're talking about that ball and I'm like, oh, how did it get there? Oh, it's like, you know, the ball was, was kicked by, you know, Lucy or someone, maybe a particular person. So I use a different ordering there because I'm starting with the ball and I want to say how, what happened to it to, for it to happen to get here. And so this is what happens. That, that's passive. I can use the passive voice there to express the same meaning. It's still the ball, the girl's the agent of kicking here. But in, in, in English, in every language, there are many ways to phrase the same event. And so that's one, this is the active voice versus the passive voice. The, the passive voice is very useful. People, it's got a bad rap in writing. People, and, you know, there's, there's some sort of grammarians, descriptive grammarians from a while ago have just said, oh, pass, don't use the passive, don't use passive. Passive is very functionally useful um, because we, we, it's when we're already talking about something, we want to keep talking about it. And then if that happens to be the, the, the patient of whatever the next event is, we, we use the passive. And that's actually easier for people to, to understand. And so um, that's not, you know, so we, we've, I've investigated, you know, passive and it's not hard to understand relative to active, contrary to some popular belief. Anyways, but all languages have many different, that's just one way, one so-called alternation of syntactic alternation of saying the same thing. We have many of them in every language. So we have a so-called double object alternation in English also. So we have, you know, I could say um, uh, Mary uh, gave a book to John, or I can say Mary gave John a book. So Mary, there's the agent and John is the patient. And I can either put um, the patient first, or I can put the object, the thing that's, sorry, sorry the object of, of the thing being passed or the or the goal of where it's going first. And, and English just allows two orders there. So either I say, um, gave the book to John, I use this little extra word in there, a preposition to mark that it's a goal, or I put John first, gave John the book. I can do either way and it's fine. And and that's another, you know, and, and there's actually, there's this, as a, a linguist at Stanford in the linguistics department, her name's Beth Levine, and she wrote a book called, I can't remember what it's called, but it's this summary, she calls it like an, an, an introductory approach to English verbs or something like this and their alterations. And she goes through every English verb at the time, you know, it's about, it's about 20, 30 years ago, but it's, it's like pretty much current verbs in English. So thousands of verbs and categorizes them in all their different ways that they can alternate. And so it's a really great resource actually for how verbs work, uh, of, of descriptively how verbs um, connect with one um, with, with different alternations. And there's hundreds of different alternations when you look at all the different kinds of verbs within English. And this is true in every language. And this is probably because, as I say, we wanna start with what's old, which is currently talking about and go to what's new and, and therefore, we need different ways to say the same thing. We need different syntaxes to say the same idea. Okay, so we just took advantage of this when in our paper. We're like, oh, okay, English does this. And then we can just give people materials where we say something weird, 
and and see how they interpret it. Okay, and so I could say this girl kicked the ball kind of example. I could say instead of the girl kicked the ball, I could say the ball kicked the girl. And and when you hear that or read that sentence, how do you interpret that? And overwhelmingly, people will interpret per, 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 uh, the sentence the ball kicked the girl as if the ball's the agent and the girl's the it, uh, is the girl is the patient. So it's some weird event where balls are kicking other people, kicking people for some reason. It's a weird thing. Okay, so that's interesting. That that's data. And then we can we can look at double object cases as well. We can say, okay, now I can say, um, Mary gave John a book. Now I'm going to flip those. I'm going to say, Mary gave a book John. Or I can say, Mary gave John to a book. And interestingly there, in those cases, the intuition is very different. And, and, and the data suggests it's very different. When you hear Mary gave a book John, uh, your intuition is not, that's a crazy sentence. My intuition is not, that's a crazy sentence. My, my intuition is you made an error there. Maybe you left out a word or something. I don't really know what's going on, but you meant that that uh, John was supposed to get that book and Mary gave it to him. That's what you meant. You probably left the word too out. I didn't hear it or something is my guess. And so we can like look at materials like these. And, and it turns out that just by accident in English and other languages, there's like different ways of saying these, these, these different alternations. And so we happen to mark the goal of that one with a two word and they're both after the verb in English for these for this double object case and for some reason um, people will interpret those as if there was an error okay but notice when I said the ball kicked the girl you don't think there was an error it's just like you just said something crazy and so we're, that could have been an error it could have been the ball was kicked by the girl or maybe or maybe you flipped those two nouns there was an exchange you know and for some reason so what we're trying to do here is by looking at a, a, a range of materials by just by the way that english just happens to be which happens to have these alternations and they have more or fewer morphemes marking these different alternations we can just see how people interpret sentences and and then we can maybe get a get an estimate a, a, an idea about how people typically process um, sentences and, and what the noise model is. We're trying to like indirectly get at the noise model for how people are, are, are reinterpreting, interpreting what, what you meant given what I said. And so in that case there, what we think is going on, we, we, we get evidence for like if there's a single deletion of, of a function word, people will very often interpret those as being um, as, as just being an error. Okay, that's an error and I can interpret that in the plausible way, in the more plausible way. But if you have to exchange two nouns across a verb, people just don't want to do that. They just, they just, they, so the noise model does not allow long distance exchanges. I mean, that, that's what we can infer from investigating a lot, of, a lot of different cases in English. It turns out there's very nice generalizations, which is that you know, deletions of single words, people will highly, very, very often in, in, interpret as errors and just guess that they, they meant the more plausible thing. So we, what we find from this is evidence for in normal language processing for some kind of noise model we can find like we basically take shannon's idea it's like well if if language is probably noisy language is noisy you know so it's noisy it's noisy for a variety of reasons okay we can investigate that you know one is that i i don't speak perfectly no one speaks perfectly no one speaks or writes perfectly you know so the existence the the, the observation that we don't write perfectly is kind of really apparent when you consider the notion of um of, of proofreading, <laughs> you know, when, when you write something, presumably you know what you meant and you tried to say what you meant, right? And then you give it to someone else and they proofread it. And there's all kinds of errors that you didn't mean to, for there to be there. And so like, that's evidence of my biases in writing, whatever those are. I mean, it's a very interesting, those are, those are interesting data about the kinds of things that humans are not noticing so there's that there's a prior there on what we thought we must have said versus and, and what, what was obviously meant and what we actually what we actually wrote and so and so, so so people can find so obviously we're not writing perfectly and it's kind of apparent from any speech that people don't speak perfectly um depending on how familiar you are with the topic and you know how much you've talked about a topic before you may be very prone to error. You know, people will have all kinds of speech errors and they may say the wrong things. And so I'm like, if I'm familiar with the topic, I get better at talking about it. So it's probably a lot of rehearsal going on there, right? So if I've talked about a particular topic many, many times, then it's not it's not very hard for me to talk about it just because I'm probably rehearsed. I've, I've at least got the concepts, you know, I, I don't have to like, you know, re find those from scratch, make those up. That's like just being found. Then I can, 
find the particular order of the words is more easily because the concepts are more familiar to me probably. Anyways, a lot of noise there. And then of course there's noise in, in, in you, the listener, because you're going to have priors, biases about what I probably meant given what I said. And so you're going to make errors in interpreting what I say all the time. We're always making this. So we just think of it as a Bayesian process. You know, it's like I'm trying to guess what you said um, given what I heard. Right. And so um, I, I guess what, really what I want to know is guess what you meant what given what I heard. You know, what you said, maybe you I'm trying to like infer away your speech errors as well. And of course, then there's background noise. There's stuff in between. So, you know, if it's a noisy environment and um, I, I sort of did, you know, the thing is like how well each of us knows each other's language, right? And so if I'm a second language speaker, um, I and I know, you know, you know that about me, you're going to make a lot of inference there depending on, or a first language speaker and you're just learning it, a kid, right? We, we, we think this is just always what's going on. is just some sort of inference always happening. And so we're just trying to spell that out and try to figure out what the noise model is in sort of adult um, uh, l language speakers of their of their communities. And so this, this first project was all about English and we had a whole bunch of different constructions and we were able to infer a noise model there, which is pretty simple. And then we, and since in, in more recent work, we've been, you know, elaborating that and testing that idea, those kinds of ideas in other languages. And it turns out that English examples, you know, do nicely generalize pretty well. It's not perfect. I can tell you, like, I mean, I think, there's, there, there is a generalization which works well across all languages. It wasn't what we said there. <laughs> that was not the right theory point. But so um, so I do think there's a lot of deletion. People make inference about deletion a lot. And they actually make a lot of inference about exchanges. So exchanges are very common in production. People do make, they're, they're, I mean, they're somewhat common. I should say of the kinds of errors that people make, they're pretty common. Uh, in So that, that that is, I will sometimes say that, you know, I'll, I'll just exchange two nouns, you know, and, and the context will usually spill, fill that over and you won't even notice. You wouldn't even notice if I make this. You can find these errors and things that people say all the time where they'll say something, they'll say the opposite of kind of what they, of what they meant and, and people never notice because it's, it's obvious from the context what, what was meant. And so there's a lot of kind of famous sort of examples of this of, in speech and people make fun of them, but it's like this normal language production. So that's what that's about. It's like, so we're just thinking about languages communication and uh, then trying to see if that model, well, figuring out what the noise model is in, in part in English and in generalizing to other languages and then seeing if that way of thinking about language might help explain why the word orders in, in human language look the way they do. You know, And so that, that wasn't in that paper, that was other work later on where we tried to make guesses about that in which we're, 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 we're trying to do that in, in other work. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the languages communication view itself. And I think here it's a good place to bring in some of the evidence that you've collected together in the book that you're working on right now. And you talk about um, some of the work from Ev Fedorenko's lab, which really is suggesting that regions of the brain that represent and process language only do that. And you also talk a little bit about how this suggests as you just said, languages for communication and contra Chomsky, that it is not for thought. And I want to understand this kind of disagreement a little bit better. And I, I pulled some quotations from Chomsky just to better understand his view. I don't know how representative this is because I'm not familiar with the full body of his work. But I also did see he said he takes it for granted that thinking is a domain that is quite different from language, even though language is used for the expression for thought. And for a good deal of thinking, we really need the mediation of language. And I kind of read that as like, language and thought aren't necessarily the same thing, but he seems to think that for maybe more complicated things that we might think. I think you brought up the example of like, if we have to deal with more complicated, I don't know, maybe long, big numbers, like 15 or something, then we might need language to really begin to parse that. But I guess I'd love to hear a little bit in more detail how you think about this language thought communication distinction and kind of countering how, how Chomsky thought about it. Sure. Yeah. Chomsky said a lot of things, you know, over a long time. And, and uh, you know, I don't think it's always, you know, if it was me, I probably would be saying things which are not always exactly the same all the time either. And so we're the, 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 the interesting claim that he has made 
uh, and I don't know where there's like so many, many times, not just once, but over and over and over. So it, that's, it sounds a little different from that quote there where he, that sounds very conciliatory to our, uh, our, our approach because, you know, back in the, you know, he's been talking about this for 50 years or 60 years. And so if you get quotes from certainly 2002 and below, everything is like language and thought are the same. Like they are like language is evolved for complex thought. It's very clear. Like there's no, that sounds like a more uh, nuanced view later where he's kind of like saying, well, of course there's things where we don't use language, which we don't, that the thinking is independent of language for, you know, we don't use, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, even that he would never have said, so he would never said that all of thought was language. He doesn't say that, but he thinks that there's some, some complex ideas you needed language for. That was the claim that we're arguing with and disputing and saying that we're thinking that. And so I, I do, I mean, I mean, you know, he comes from a philosophical tradition. Okay. So the philosophical tradition, the sort of methods are different. You know, the, me the method, I, I mean, I'm not wild about the methods. The methods are, you know, sit and think and try and figure this out. And I, I just don't, I mean, I don't mind that as a way to get started as to what's sort of plausible, but I want to like use some kind of quantitative empirical data that we can like use to like decide among positions. And, and so to try to understand how, you know, whether language and whatever we call thought are the same or different, we kind of need, like we need some tasks and we need, and we need some, uh, and we need some measures and, and it, and doing things behaviorally, purely behaviorally is just not that helpful, I think. And so what I mean by behaviorally, you know, even my work, work that I've done, with, you know, so Steve Piantidosi, we have a paper from 2012 where we argued that um, ambiguity is functional. So, you know, you know in language, and, and so, uh, and so he, Chomsky is famous in saying that language, you know, couldn't be for communication because it has properties like ambiguity. And we're like, well, that's not, that doesn't follow actually. It, you know, we're just saying, look, in terms of information theory, communicate, you know, ambiguity is actually useful. And it doesn't actually make sense in his alternative view that, that why there would be ambiguity at all. So we're, but even, but these don't decide the issue. This kind, these are behavior. So this is like, look at what we're doing is looking at, you know, how words look or how structures look across a lot of languages. And they have some properties which are suggestive to us. They're certainly consistent with information theoretic sort of communication ways, ways of thinking about it. But if you want to see like, is thinking, the same or different from language, then the most obvious methods are to look, like have people do language, have people do other kinds of complex thought and see which areas of the brains are, are, are being used, right? And so that's what Federico's lab has been doing for many, many years. And so it, it turned, it's a really amazing research program. So I can, you can lie in the scanner, I can lie in the scanner for like 20 minutes, 15 minutes, just listen to language or read language for a bit and, and have some control, which is non-language. So like maybe you read sentences and then you read non-words. Okay. It doesn't matter what, what the, what you've got, or you can listen to, you know, English, if your native language is English, doesn't really matter. And, and, and listen to some language you don't speak as a control. Okay. And so then, and then we're going to get, um, in, in for that contrast, we're going to get the language areas of the brain. It turns out there's a network is a, a left lateralized, Front, a network goes from the front all the way around to the back. And, you know, there's, uh, there's a, a, a large network in every single person, which is left lateralized. People used to think, oh, it's left lateralized for right handers and right lateralized for left handers. That's not true for left handers and right handers. You have a left lateralized system. Doesn't matter if you're left hand. There's a little more on the right, but for left handers, maybe, but it's just, it's just this left lateralized system for people with you know, a typical brains, it's almost always massively left lateralized system. And so we can localize that system very quickly, 15 minutes, listen, listen to language, listen to non-language, and we can find a bunch of voxels, which are very special, which are, which are doing language. Okay. And then we can test this question. Do they do anything else? And then do anything else? <laughs> so then do anything else? Like choose your task. She's like, people like, oh, music is like language. So wait, music has no, none of that, that whole left lateralized system does not, does not process music. There are areas that process music. So, but that left, so when I'm talking about the language system that Ev, that Fedorenko is talking about here, I'm really talking about higher level language. I'm talking, not talking about the sound properties. So of course, when we're talking about the sound properties of language, there's going to be some overlap there in the, in the, um, in the, in the music properties, because that's just like audio, audio cortex. Okay. So audio cortex. Above that, we're talking about higher level language, which is like 
the, the sort of meanings of words and their compositions, it turns out. That's kind of, you know, putting those things together. So understanding and producing language, and it turns out producing or understanding, this system lights up. And, and, in every, and I've been scanned by Fedorenko for like a very long time now. And, and another fascinating property of this, of this system is it doesn't change. So I, I, I think I was first scanned in 2007 and my scans there, my language system, it's like identical to the scans that are done, like, I mean, up to like tiny statistical variabilities, you know, uh, uh, to ones I ran like this, this past year, this year. Okay. It's like, you know, that's how many years is that? That's 16, what is 2000? 16 years and it's unchanged. And my language system is like yours, but very different from yours. It's left lateralized. But it's at least as similar or as different as my as my face is to yours. Okay, so it's like it's like my head is kind of well. It's like I'm a human and you're a human and we have an eye, we have two eyes, and we have a nose, and we have a mouth and stuff, and they're kind of in the same orientation. But my left language system is is maybe a little more variable than that compared to your face. And so so I'm gonna have a very and so it really matters to find my language system and find your language system and then find in those systems what other things go on. And it turns out if you you know, you want to do a complex, some some complex new task, you know, it's just not going to be in the language system. Just, and, and she's tested, I don't know, 20 different kinds of things that people have said overlap with language. And there's just, it's not even close. There's like zero overlap. And so, and, and there's another whole um, realm of work. This is, this is this woman at um, University College London, uh, Rosemary Varley. She works with a certain kind of aphasia, people with brain damage to, you know, um, language areas of the brain, but they, but these are called global aphasia, global aphasics. So, you know, you know, many aphasics who've had brain damage to some part of the language area um, can be rehabilitated and can speak somewhat. And, you know, that depending on what, what, which areas have been damaged and what, 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 what they can say and what they can um, understand. Okay. And, and uh, there's another, there's an there's a other unfortunate group who've lost their entire language. So, so they've had a very large left lateralized stroke, okay? And it's wiped out a lot of left hemisphere in various ways. And, and so wiped out the, la the language network entirely. Um, and if the stroke is left lateralized and hasn't damaged the right, so there's a lot of thinking left over elsewhere. And so they can do anything else except for language. These A few of these patients, there's such a, like Rosemary's Varley says a few of these patients, of course, if they have a larger stroke and they can't, you know, lose, lose more of their brain, they can't, you know, they can lose other tasks for other reasons, other abilities to, to think. But there's a, you know, a certain group here who are good controls in that they can, they can play chess with you, they can drive, they can learn new tasks, they can do, they, they can't talk to you. They don't speak and you can't, and you, they don't understand you when they speak. People say, "Well, how do you communicate with them?" Well, you can communicate with people who have a lot of shared um, a shared background. So I I work with a couple of remote groups. You know, the the Pirahan. I work with the Chimani in 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 the in um, remote areas of um, uh, Amazon, and I can communicate. I don't speak these languages, but I can communicate with them, uh, which is a lot harder, frankly, <laughs> than communicating with someone who has shared context. So someone who's had brain damage and has just grown up in my area. So these are British people because they're all University College London. So they, they, you know, they grew up in England and they lived their lives in England. They just lost their language network. But they understand tasks. They understand the. They went to school. They are at. They are educated people. So they know about learn. They know what you know scientists are and they know that people want to understand them and help them and so they are trying to understand their tests you just can't talk to them um they so you have to communicate through you know signing like sort of making up signs for things and and do you know point it's mostly it's like copy me right so do what i do and they understand that so you can communicate with them just fine i mean it's harder but it's doable uh anyway and they uh so that the the, the existence of these people you know suggests that and the and 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 Federenko's work on on just sort of looking at you know my language area and and any other task I might do and the fact that there's no overlap um, suggests that thinking anything you might call thinking I mean if you think thinking is something other than the twenty odd tasks she's uh, she's run then you know it's up to you know let's let's find I want to know what that task is I want to know what that task is which you think that language is necessary for for that task. You know, and so you might think even arithmetic, you know, you might think doing math and stuff. And, and that's not language. It's fascinating. Even that, even that. So Stan Dehane is a, you know, a researcher um, in um, France who's worked on 
arithmetic on work on sort of math um, processing. And he used to think, you know, 20 years ago, I think he thought that um, language and math were the same areas because there's left, there's, there's, there's some stuff going on in the left frontal area. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the left frontal for language. And the way that the so the way that the um, research was done back there was kind of global averages. You take all of us, all of our brains, do the do the tasks, put them into an average brain, and you say, oh, it's like, oh, it's left frontal and this kind and these kind of coordinates on average, and these coordinates are very very close to one another. We think it's the same, the, the same voxels doing the same things, and it, it's just bad stats. It's a bad inference there, you know. So you shouldn't you shouldn't do that because because my brain's different from your brain. We don't want to. We don't want to like put them into an average brain and make inferences like that. I mean, you can do that for to some degree to sort of see how you know how the language network typically looks across many people. But you can't make an inference about whether particular voxels are doing something. You can't do that. And so over the years, he's just like totally. He's realized as he took picked up Benarenko's methods and stuff that he's like, no, it's, it's a completely separate system. The the math processing system is it's some. You know, I don't know if there's a specific math processing system. There's a frontal parietal whole network, which is doing something which does all kinds of novel, complicated tasks. That's called the, you know, I, I think they call that uh, the multiple demands network or something. But different people call this network different things. And and that is like, you know, any if I ask you to do a task like keep track of a few squares, you know, a, a visual task where you have to look at a few squares and add them together in real time. So you see a flash of a few squares on a grid and another few squares and another few squares. And then, then you're given a, a set of three choices. Which one is the sum of those three things you saw? It's a hard task, depending on how many, how many squares there are, right? You, know, you can imagine that being very difficult. That's a, that's a, a multiple demands task. It's not a language task. This is, you, know, you might think it might help. It doesn't help to use language. People don't use language, I think, to solve these tasks. Anyway, so that's what I think is the strongest evidence. And so um yeah so that's that's why my, my view is that sort of answered the question <laughs> i think her work Benarenko and varley's work just like answers the question language and thought or stink i mean if you have a they, and i think that's the way to do it i think that that's the way to answer this question is through you know seeing what our brains are doing while you're doing these tasks and i think if you if you have some idea of some other task if someone has an idea about what that task is which they think language is necessary for um, and it doesn't involve just like speaking. <laughs> if, of course, like if you listen to songs and they have words, it, it, of course that that light, lights up the language network. You know that's not terrible interest. It's got language, language doing language, not not interesting. We want a task which isn't obviously language, and somehow you need the language network for. It. And I just I just there aren't any so far. Um, you know I'm a I'm an empiricist, so if 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 she's wrong, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but so far I think there's a simple. Here, which is language, and that fits with the simple story about communication as well. Like that, 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 that what is language? Language is a communication system. That fits with everything that I've been saying. That fits with. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't come in thinking that. By the way, I didn't think that. I just, uh, uh, I didn't really know. I had any idea. I was just. I really, when I, you asked me to start this, why do I do this? I just thought this problem of weird sentences was neat, and and does it tells us about how language is processed. It turns out. You know, following that through and sort of keep expanding, it pushes us towards, I think, that language is, human language is an invented cultural system that we invent in order to communicate with each other. And that's a very anti-Chomskyan view. And Chomskyan thinks that language is innate um, and, uh, you know, that, that aspects of human language is, is, are innate and they're not... Um, you know, it's nothing to do with, you know, where you grew up, or, you know, cultural things. It's not that. And so it's a very different view than um, a lot of the people that I was around for all these years. But I'm just like driven by the simplicity of the hypothesis and the evidence. I'm like, I just don't get um, I, I think it's, it's such a simple hypothesis, for goodness sake. It's like the obvious thing. If you talk to any CS person, which I, the CS people I think of are generally kind of smart people who don't always work in these topics and they always think, oh, language is communication. That's certainly what I thought when I first, I was surprised to hear that there was like a big debate about this, that language might be for something else. And it's like, I don't even know what it means when he says it's for complex thought. I don't, cause it's like, it's never nailed down. What is the complex thought that you think language is new? Like I need a task. What is the task that I need that isn't language? I don't know what it, it doesn't tell you. And so um, anyway, <laughs> that's my view. <laughs>
Yeah, and it's interesting, I guess, to kind of flip that around and generalize what that says about thought. And you laid this out pretty explicitly in your book, where you say that we think thoughts without language. And then you also point out that specifically, I guess, you with a small minority of people lack an inner voice, which is really interesting because I guess I, being in the majority, feel like I have this kind of endless inner monologue and anything that I do internally, I'm... It feels like I'm always representing my thoughts even to myself with language. So when we say that we think thoughts without language, that just felt very unintuitive to me. Yeah, I, I think I, I find that we always come to this. <laughs> the people love this topic. It's because I think I think I I'm not that unusual. So I, I did an internet poll. I was very surprised to hear that people think they hear themselves talking. I find that so bizarre. I, as weird as you think. It is for me to not think I feel that. I feel it very weird that like it feels like limiting to me. Like I, I, because I, I feel like talking is slow relative to thinking. And so if you have to like like imagine reading a novel like out loud, it's slow, right? And you know, no one talks like this. Like you read it like three times as fast. I read three times as fast as I can talk. I'm sure. And so it just seems very limiting to me. It feel like that's my intuition that it seems like why would I do that? But um, I gather you're in, you're in the majority. So I, I actually did an internet poll years ago because I couldn't believe people thought this. And 80%, it was like 75 or 80% of people think they, they they basically think in language all the time. And uh, I, I mean, there's a sizable minority. I'm not in total minority. This is not very scientific, to be fair. Okay, this is just like asking a thousand people. It was like actually about 20,000 people. Tons of people filled this out. They were so fascinated by this. And, uh, and, and so there's like... There's some sense where some people feel like they hear it or don't hear it inside them. And I just don't feel like, I mean, it's not like I can't, I can, I can feel like if I want to, I can start listening, try to talk to myself, like without talking out loud, but I just don't, uh, you know, cause what I, if I want to do that, I'll talk. And that's my, that's what my wife says. <laughs> the reason I don't have an inner voice <laughs> is because my outer voice is going all the time. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, I've heard other people, other people's intuitions. If you speak a bunch of languages, multilinguals, they, I don't know if this is true or not, but the, the claim is that uh, they have less of an inner voice because they have to like speak all these languages. And which one are you going to talk in? Like if you have all these, like if you're really, really good with multiple languages, why would you, you know, which one are you choosing? I guess you could pick one. I don't know, but I've had people, but anyway, this is all non-scientific. I feel like this is, this is intu intuitions. There's a guy called Gary Lupian at uh, University of Wisconsin in uh, Madison, and he's trying to figure out methods to investigate this question, you know, better than this. This is just like, like we can't, I, can't, I wouldn't want to try and publish any of this. It's just like, I feel like maybe Chomsky got pushed as far as he did in some ways because he has a very strong inner voice or something. Maybe, I don't really know, like, and I don't. And so I'm like, I just don't understand this. And so it's, it's fine. You know, I feel like it's not, um, it's not, you remember the dress, there was this dress on the internet a few years ago where people could either see it as, as um, blue and black or gold and white, I think, or something like that. And you see it as one or the other and you can't believe the other people see it the other way. And I feel it's kind of like that without, isn't it? Like that was almost 50, 50, right? People just see it one way or the other. And it was like crazy how sort of evenly split it was. And uh, this is like that. That's why people like to talk about it in a way in that way you, you know, there's a, you just can't believe that there's this other group out there <laughs> that, you know, cause you can't like, I, it's hard for me to imagine what it would be like having an inner voice. And so it just seems so inhibiting. And you, on the other hand, <laughs> feel like, what how how is he going about his life without an inner voice and i think i think maybe chomsky is one of them is like someone who just thinks that they're the same that but i, I mean he would never say that um I, he doesn't talk about inner voice well he, he sometimes does no, that's, that's that's not true he sometimes does talk about it because he says 90 he says 90 percent i've done one quote i read once was 90 percent of the language is to yourself he would say 90 percent of language so it's not like we're talking to someone else it's most of the language you give is about talking to yourself. And, I'm, and I read that quote once and I was like, wow, what is he talking about? And I'm like, because I was like, <laughs> I didn't know what he was. And then that was when I pushed on this inner voice. That's why I sort of started, started on I'm like, what is he even saying? And I realized lots of people here have this inner voice. And I always thought I'd read about inner voice and I thought it was a metaphor. I didn't know that people really feel like they're hearing themselves talk. And uh, anyway, I don't know what to make it. This is like. This is someone else's re research. I don't work on this. I, I think this is like interesting 
you know, it's interesting to speculate as to why we come up with the hypotheses we do. Um, it, 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 is, it is kind of interesting, right? So the why, why you, you have this very, you know, you probably, it's kind of interesting to think that you, you probably do think language, it's not so crazy to think language and thought are the same because you're always talking to yourself in, internally. If you have an internal monologue going on about, because I don't even know what goes on. Does that happen all the time? Like when you're just like outside looking at a scene, are you talking? I mean, to yourself, is it going on? That's a good question. Because it's like never going on for me. So I, like, it's very simple to tell you what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it's it's definitely not all the time. I would say it's enough of a fraction of the time that I feel like. But also, I, I suppose probably a lot of it is like, maybe it has to do with the particular things I'm thinking about. Like if I am, for example, playing a piece of music, then yeah, I th- I guess, you know, when I'm just kind of like, looking at the notes and finding the right places on my violin or something. I'm not necessarily thinking about when I'm not thinking about it in language all the time. I might need to jump in and like kind of talk myself through, okay, how do I like articulate this phrase or what fingering should I use here? And that requires me to make use of language to do something. But I I guess you're right. Yeah. When we think about musical processing, that's a really good example of something where there is a kind of a directness to it that I don't need the mediation of language for. I would bet that's the case. And so, I mean, I, when I work, like I've, I've done sort of work, a little work with sort of visual games and stuff. And I find like, if you, if you need the words, you're going to be worse at it. And if you can, if you can get away from the words, if you need some language to mediate this process, it's going to be slower and harder. And if you can just directly solve these visual problems without words, then you'll, you'll get them better. And I, 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 that, that's the sense I get from these these kinds of games, uh, but maybe I'm just biased by my own. <laughs> I have this. I have. I do have this strong sense that language is not helpful um, there. And so, I, I wonder if there's an analog of fluency to this, though, because when I think about like when I'm learning a new language, for instance, I had that experience of there was when I was learning Chinese in high school. There was this point where I kind of just stopped translating between Chinese and English in my head when I was listening to Chinese or when I was speaking it. And in my example of music earlier, for example, I still remember when I was not very good at violin, having to do a lot more of that mediation of, okay, well, where does this note go? Like, I need to put this finger here. And I think that the more facility I gained with playing, the less I had to do that. And so it was kind of there as a crutch, if that makes sense. I'm I'm now thinking of this as like almost a, a fluency with the task thing as well. Right. But that but that falls then that language is not necessary. Like language is helping you initially. And then once you know how once you can like actually think in that whatever that whatever the relevant representations are for that system that you're trying to do without language, then you can do it better and faster, I think. It's like, uh, that's that's the I think that's the analogy. That's that's how it feels to me. It's like I can actually get around language definitely helps to maybe to learn to start these. So that's a different, maybe that's a different other question. So like I'm talking about language processing and how like, it's like maybe language is necessary or helpful in the developmental stages. You know, it might, that, that's a different question. So like, maybe like, I don't really know, like that's, we don't have any stake in that one. I mean, it's a really interesting question, whether you need language. So that's kind of gets back to, you know, lear- learning, like we might need language for learning number, right? So understanding the math concepts of number, like language might help you there in learning those things. It probably does. It seems to me plausible that it does, but that doesn't mean that it helps you think in numbers. It just helps you. It's a crutch to get into that system in a way, right? So that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. 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 And that is a totally different discussion from the questions of, of language processing. I'd love to go through some of the main ideas that kind of come up in your book. And we've talked about dependency grammar a little bit in the conversation. And I do kind of want to bring us to this conclusion of, well, what does all this say about modern large language models? And so perhaps you could introduce a little bit in more detail this positive contribution for what grammar is that you bring up in the book, and as well the critique of claims made by Chomsky of the form of grammar. Sure. So yeah, I have this, I wrote this book and it's going to be coming out sometime soon, I hope. And it's called Syntax, A Cognitive Approach. And so the idea, I actually wrote this book. I was just intending to write like a syntax primer for actually for Federenko. If Federenko wanted this for her group because she wanted people 
if you wanted me to write something about language so that about syntax, because people want to know about syntax, but they don't really, the, the sort of standard literature out there is pretty kind of um, complicated in a weird way. And so I was just trying to write an intro and it just grew and grew and grew. And, and um, it's, so the idea, the approach is very, is kind of simple. I, I, it takes the, the, the ideas I was just saying earlier, everyone, I think every, all language researchers agree. I think that most, that utterances are mostly directed acyclic graphs, which is just this tree. Most utterances have like a head and there's a bunch of dependencies off of them. And, um, the, and, and that's just the whole, that's basically it for the claim I'm making in, in this, in this book is just like that syntax that, and, and we can look at dependency structure is, is syntax. That's pretty much most of what we need. And we can talk about the details of what the grammar is in English or what the grammar is in some other language. We can work, work those out about what the particular rules are, what the orders are, what the heads and dependents are. And so, you know, that, that's the claim. Um, and then what I, what I, the positive part about that is that allows you very, sim very simply to uh, exp explain facts about word order across languages. So this is about orders of heads, the, the words like verbs and the nouns, for instance, the orders in which they occur in English versus the order they occur in other languages. And, and there's a lot of other kinds of categories in a, in a given language. So we have prepositions in English, the so word like of comes before a noun or in or on like these sums come before the nouns and in a word like in language like Japanese they come after they're they're post positions right they, they so you you put them after the nouns instead of saying in the room you'll say room in in Japanese um, and, um, and so the 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 positive thing of the book one of the positive things is like just just explaining just aspects of what dependency structure is then then there are these generalizations about word order which follow from dependency length minimization. Basically, all language, that's something I mentioned earlier, all languages like dependencies to be close. English likes it, Japanese likes it, whatever language you like, they all like to have them close. And that ends up explaining not only, that's explaining the, the kinds of rules that, that do occur in, in, in languages. And so we, you know, so though I, I mentioned that English is a language which has heads, then the verbs come before. They're nouns typically, except for the subject, which comes after, come, sorry, uh, the subject comes before, the, everything else comes after the verb. So I say the, the, the girl kicked the ball, the girl gave the book to the boy, the, bur the girl said that this happened. So, you know, there's all that stuff comes after the verb, except for girl, the agent is the thing that comes before, everything else comes after. And in Japanese, it's, the, it's, it's those things come after. And then, and, and that, so that's one ordering the verbs relative to their arguments. Another ordering is I just mentioned prepositions, okay? English is a prepositional language. Prepositions come before. Japanese is a postpositional language. Those things come after. And it turns out that those correlate. So if you have a pre-verbal language like English, uh, post-verbal, sorry. So it's a, the, the, if the nouns tend to come after the verb, verb it's a verb initial language. Uh, more verb initial, and uh, then they happen to have these things called prepositions. And if you have the, and if you have a verb final language, then those things tend to have postpositions. And if you just kind of draw the dependency graphs, which is very hard in an audio here, in an audio format here, but if you draw the dependency graphs, it turns out that doing it that way minimizes dependency lengths. Okay, so you'll you'll say things like, I gave you know a book to Mary, and to Mary and gave are both in that sentence, and it's good to have those things in the same order, in, in, in having prepositions before the nouns and verbs before bef, before the nouns. Do that, if, and then or or both and after. If you do it both after, otherwise you end up with this. You end up with longer distance connections between the heads and dependents in a language. So that's what what I like about dependency grammar is that it's it, it explains. It, it not only is a very simple structure for human languages, it also explains a lot about why they look the way they do, why grammars look the way they do. And so that was like, that's the main sort of positive um, um, uh, com contribution of this book. And then it's also connected, you know, I'm trying to just connect it to, uh, you know, cog mod modern cognitive science and what, what factors are involved in modern cognitive science about, you know, to understanding what, what the difference is between language being acceptable versus, you know, grammatical, grammatical is like a theoretical notion was like, you know, just explaining that in kind of some detail. Now, there's also a discussion in there about the, 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 there's a, there's a really famous alternative kind of approach, which is the Chomskyan approach. So Noam Chomsky did a lot of stuff 
Um, he had this, he was a philosopher of language, but he's also a grammarian working on the grammars of different languages, mostly English. And his proposal going back to 1957 is that there's a, sort of a phrase structure, which is very comparable in many ways to dependency structure. So I'm not, you know, but there's also this other component, which is called movement. Okay. So he thinks his idea is that um, there's, there are dependencies between different kinds of representations, not just within the representation, but within between meanings of two different sentences. So if I say John is in the room, the way you form a W, uh, sorry, a yes, no question, a question from that sentence is you move, you literally move the auxiliary verb, the, the verb there is to the front. So John is in the room is directly related to is John in the room? You're, there's a movement process there. And so then he, he, has, he has an empty category associated with that movement process. And, and he made, so he, he, he provided a theory of that and, 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 and of that detail. And not only did he provide a theory of it, he also later, in the, so he did in the 50s, later in the sort of 70s, he discussed why he thought that led to um, learnability problems with grammar. And so it made like the fact that English, no, the fact that human languages are like this, they have phrase structure and movement, turns out to lead to problems for, for how we can figure out what the right grammar even is from, from the input. So it's, it means it can't be really learned. So he thinks it must be. So then he like doubles down and he says, well, he doesn't at the time, I think he just didn't realize what he was doing. And some I don't really know. I can't get into his head. But he says that it's unlearnable. Therefore, it's innate. And, 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 and so that's this universal grammar claim, which sort of really started popping up in around 1971. And he was really talking about auxiliary verb inversion. That was his main example there. And he's like saying, look, John is in the room is related to his John in the room. It must be movement. And, and he didn't realize, or, or if he did realize, he just discarded. There's a different story. There's, there's different theories about that without movement. And so the alternative theory of move, that, that, that is, which may be going on there, which I think is more plausible, which is like in fits the empirical data better, is that it's just, there's just kind of two is's, okay? There's an is in the declarative and there's an is in the interrogative. And, uh, you know, and one of those is, you know, declarative is, and one of them is interrogative and, and not one doesn't move to form the other. There's just, there's just two different, there's two different functions for that word and not, not, not neither moves from the other. You're just learning two kind of um, maybe one sort of meaning and, and then two different syntaxes for that word. Okay. And I use either, I use interrogative syntax or I use de declarative syntax, depending on what I'm trying to say. Okay. And, and that's a different story where there's no movement and, and that's very learnable. You just learn from the input, you know, probably, you know, and, and so I think maybe what's going on and, and the reason I think that's very more, uh, it's like, I'm not the, I'm not the one to say this. So lots of people have been arguing this for a long time. And so, but you know, one of the arguments for that case is that, you know, he thinks that all, all, all auxiliary verbs move and do this, but they, but they don't, I mean, it is empirically false that, that claim. And so there's like, there are words like do, which are only auxiliary verbs. And so when I say, you know, Mary kicked the ball again. Okay. Mary kicked the ball. If I want to make a question from that, I don't go kick to marry the ball. That's, I don't do that. Right. I, I have to like bring in did, I have to say, did Mary kick the ball? There's something called do support in English, which is just for these, you know, actually for the most common sets of situations where we have either a simple present or a simple past or anything. We always have to do this. And like when I say, did Mary kick the ball? Like there's, it, that's not Mary did kick the ball. That's Mary kicked the ball. Like if you want to, there is another version of did, which is like an emphatic contrast of did, where I can say Mary did kick the ball. And why I say in a situation where, you know, someone else may have, but no, what's the situation there? Mary did kick the ball. I guess there's some uncertainty about whether she did or didn't do that event. And so I say she did kick the ball. But in the normal non non contrastive sense, I can't say Mary did kick, Mary did kick the ball. It's just bizarre, right? And so it's just it's mostly the you know ninety nine percent of usages of do and did are are interrogative, and so it's like it, it is like there's a word that is only interrogative pretty much, and uh, it, it, that that that's that's not possible under his story. And there's a bunch like that's the most common example of the problem with the story. There's lots of other cases, so. So there's like, you know, weird forms, unusual forms get brought into a language easily. And so what have I say, you know, you know, we're going to some party and I say, aren't I invited to this party? And, you know, but I can't say I aren't invite. I aren't is only first person. I mean, it's, it's another usage as well, but for the first person, it's only, 
the negative form is only for the interrogative, not for the, like I say, I am not invited for the, for the declarative. I can't say. And so there's a bunch of these kinds of cases which suggest that these things are learned item by item, which is a different, which is, which such as there's not a rule where there's things being moved. And, and so this is, this is the construction, so-called construction based approach kind of, this is sort of, so what I think is true is likely going on is a dependency. So I think construction based is probably right. And the depend and dependency grammar is sort of underlying the constructions in, in, in some way. That's the, that's the proposal. That's the idea. And I'm, so the book is just about here's a, here's like an introductory syntax for, if you're interested in syntax, this is what syntax is. And this is what it buys you. Uh, it, it shall, tells you about word order. It tells you about language processing. It tells you about language processing in the brain in some nice ways. Okay. And, and, it, and if you happen to be interested in the, in the, in the history, you know, I think it's better than this, this uh, movement story because the movement story has, has a lot of baggage associated with it. I mean, in that it's like, um, you know, Chomsky argued that it's actually unlearnable. It's impossible to learn the structures. It's not just like hard for kids or something, but actually impossible based on the input. Now that's, you know, provably false at this point, right? Because the large language models, you know, they learned English, you know, these large, you know, you know chat GPT and various languages, they know English, they do English kind of perfectly. You know, he argues about that. He wrote a, he wrote a response to some, he wrote some, some newspaper saying that, no, they couldn't do this construction or this construction or this construction. And he had some, like some, some little, you know, slightly rare constructions, but, but he didn't even check because of course they can do those constructions. Like any of those, the, the, it was just like a, a crazy article. It was like, didn't you even fact check your own claims? I mean, it, they do them just fine. The things that he says they can't do, they do perfectly. And so um, it's just not true. They do learn English. Now there's a, Perfectly, I'd say, pretty much perfectly, close to perfectly. Is it the way humans are doing it? I don't know. Um, you know, no. Certainly, I'd say let's go farther than that. No, it's not. So there's the, there's there's at least two ways in which it's quite different from how humans are learning language. And one is the volume of of text that they're trained on is you know far far beyond what a child ever gets exposed to. And and secondly. There's like an interaction with the world, which the language models don't have. They just have language. It's just text. But, but that doesn't mean they're not really neat theories, really useful theories of human language. So the, the NLP researchers who are developing these, these models, they're, they're, not, they're not solving my problem. My problem is how does the human understand and produce language? They're trying to get a, a machine to do English really well so people will use it for various things. They don't care if it's doing it the same way that a human does it. I'm the one or other psychologists like me have to go out there and try and manipulate their models or try smaller models with less smaller test sets with the same architectures, different architectures, figure out what aspects of their architectures, what aspects of their volume of text is, is necessary. And people, lots of researchers are doing this now. And, and it, it's, so just because they use so much data that's beyond the, doesn't mean they're not very nice, but potential models. And then this other thing about interacting with the world, you know, they don't interact with the world. It's just purely language. And, you know, humans obviously do interact with the world, but there's a lot of interesting cases where humans learn the language and don't interact with the world. So there's a lovely case of, you know, you'll believe blind speakers who learn about uh, color, you know, learn about the visual world and, and the way they talk is is just like people who don't just but just like seeing people and i mean there's interesting you know um ways in which they deviate which is very interesting suggesting re re you know representational differences but but that you know you can learn a lot about um the, probably about you know how language is being learned from these models i think in, in humans probably you know, you know you know but that that uh, that i'm not you know other people are involved in that kind of research i think the large language model so what i'm trying to do i think i see it as trying to understand the representations that humans have <laughs> and that large language models have. I think there's an abstraction still, which is useful to think of dependency grammar. You know, if I just give you, you know, large language model and say, this is a great, th I mean, I think it might be a really good theory of how humans you know, process and understand language. I think it's a great theory in some sense, but it's um, complicated. It's a very, you know, that's like saying, here's a human. <laughs> they do this really well. You can use them. Well, I'm going to give you, I'm trying to give you the abstractions that I think the principles are something that this system is maybe using at some level. And so that's what I'm trying to do. It's what I think, you know, grammarians, syntacticians should be doing. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, lot, there's lots of good people who, who think that way. I think maybe not, you know, not, not everyone. I think there's a, like Chomsky certainly doesn't think, doesn't like this.
you know, he doesn't like large language models, but that's okay. Yeah. One, one related question on this, I'm curious for your thoughts on is maybe just as kind of a final question here, since I think we've taken a lot of time is what this says about the, the representations that these LLMs have. And so in the conversation I had with him, Tal Lindzen kind of hypothesized that if you develop a system that is similar enough to say a human and its ability to process and its ability to create language, then you might infer that the representations it is using to accomplish that task are reasonably similar and that its behavior being so similar kind of acts on a cons- as a constraining function on the possible representations it could be using. And so the task that you're accomplishing with a system you build might say a lot about what the representations possibly are. So with all this in mind about LLMs and the fact that they seem to have been able to pick up the syntactic structures they use to use language very flexibly. Do you also perhaps think that says or at least constrains the representations that they could have and their similarity to the representations that we have for language? Uh, yes. I mean, that's exactly, my, I totally agree. I just think it's a, it's a complex, you know, kind of depends on how complicated a theory you want. I mean, the the models are kind of complicated still, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes on in these models. And so we still would like to, like, that's a complicated, any, any, any one of these models is complicated and we'd like to know which aspects of it are doing whatever is doing in human language. But I, I totally, I totally think that's a reasonable, um, like, I think a, a, a reasonable way to think about these models. So like, I think Tal works with uh, Marco Baroni and Baroni has been like been saying that these models are theories of human language, and I think that's right. I think I think he's right. I agree with that. It's like they are theories. They're complicated theories. There's a lot of parameters, a lot of stuff, but it's fine. They're like they're they're, they're they also work, which is different from most theories. You know, so most you know you know linguistic theories of language uh, don't work on real language. These things work, and so there's like trade offs here, and so presumably it's just like any science where we have more complicated and less complicated theories. And so there's like billions of parameters in a lot of these things. And so maybe, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see what, I mean, I don't know if that's crazy. Like that, that's like, maybe not a crazy, you know, that's probably the right kind of level anyways for a human mind anyways, in the, in the language system. But, but, um, you know, I think these are fine models of like fine theories. And I see my role in, in this, like in the thing I'm doing right here is just, if you can do a, a simpler theory, it just helps people to understand. I don't know. There's like different levels of abstraction for all theories, right? So we can always talk about, you know, um, you know, in physics we can have the, the theories at different levels of abstraction of the same of the same ideas. And and this that's what I see this as. I'm like I'm like at a very high level. They all they all think there's dependency structures in there, right? They all think that. Uh, and and I'm, that's all I'm saying here is I'm thinking there's dependency structures and and uh, and what that. And so I'm seeing how far you can go in a sense with that. And um, maybe, and, but may, but they, they may have the better, there's maybe the better um, theory in some sense, certainly more detailed theory of all the, of all the different um, language use phenomena, which is important. So I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a very viable, a very reasonable way to think about languages. These are theories of, I think large language models are theories of human language. And, and they can be wrong, right? Don't forget. Like just because they're theories, they can be wrong. Like so. Yeah, I, I really like this as an ending note. I think language models as theories of human language is something that a lot of us can kind of take away as as an interesting thing here. Well, Professor Gibson, I really appreciate your taking the time to speak with me today and and to share your research. This was really really fascinating. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. That's all I have for today. Thanks so much for listening to the episode. And if you like this, really the best thing you can do is to leave me a review and to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting. You can also subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast player. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest from The Gradient to receive emails whenever we have new podcasts, newsletters, articles, then you can subscribe to us on Substack where you'll get email notifications for everything.